Welcome to part three of this never-ending, ongoing collection video. <laughs> if you've survived through the first two parts, congratulations! We're about 35% uh, of the way through, so buckle in. This one hopefully shouldn't be as long as the last two, but I still have like, multiple bookcases to get through um, in the next coming videos as well. So yes. First up for this bookshelf we have the ultimate or the limited collector's edition, whatever you want to call it, release from Right Stuff of Revolutionary Girl Utena. Um, this is the 25th anniversary edition that Right Stuff put out under their Nozomi title or um, publisher, I guess. I, I talked about uh, Ikuhara quite a bit in the last uh, video just because I like him a lot and I own all of his anime aside from Sarazanmai which does not yet have a disc release uh, that is English friendly but this is his first and probably most well it's his first uh, major series that people know and probably the most famous most popular um, this is a classic like I don't I don't really I think a lot of people are unfamiliar with Utana, but if you are, it is about a middle school girl who in her childhood was rescued by a handsome prince, a la a fairy tale, and through this interaction with this prince, she now wants to become a prince herself, basically, and every, it's in classic Ikuhara fashion, it's full of symbolism, full of various different meanings, um, but over the period or over the course of the series we see a lot of breakdown of the expectations of what how these stories usually go. The relationship between Utena and Anthe, who is sort of the main other main character, <laughs> is very interesting and obviously the whole conflict with the student council and lots of different things lots of different things it's uh, again I don't <laughs> I don't really need to tell people because for a lot of people this was their introduction to Ikuhara it was their introduction to something that had such overt queer themes and such overt other themes and it is one that again you can watch over and over and gain something new from Throughout the series, it may feel very repetitive because Utena continually has to go and fight for Anthe's honor, basically. And when she does, she pulls a sword out of the other girl's chest, and that's symbolism. But you may have <laughs> uh, recognized that particular visual or iconography of the sword being drawn from the heart of the other person and that I I don't want to say that Utena invented that but I I definitely feel like that's where a lot of people were inspired from it is very evocative of Utena and that really is the first place that I think a lot of people may have recognized that from phenomenal uh, series this is the blu-ray set so it has the 39 episodes I believe it is plus the movie which is its own thing. <laughs> um, there are standard Blu-ray releases of this from um, Right Stuff as well. I, you may notice that this is still in its plastic. I haven't opened it up because I haven't decided yet whether or not I want to keep this release or to sell it and buy the UK release whenever that decides to be put out because my biggest issue with this particular release is that it is so big. Um, it comes with a rose ring, which is a very important item within the series, a replica of those, which actually held up this box set for ages and ages and ages. It's a beautiful set. Um, really, I'm sure most people who love Utena found themselves a copy at some point before it went out of print. But this is a series that has had a million different releases ever since the uh, 
late 90s, early 2000s, and it's one that continues to stay uh, a classic and is fully deserving of that title. It's, it's very, very good, and I do want to watch it on Blu-ray sometime soon, but again, I'm probably going to wait until I know more about the UK release before I want to dive into these discs because they'll be similar discs and I will, then I'll be able to make my decision. I will be fully informed on w making my decision. And in any case, I might just, I don't, I, the thing is, I don't like to keep things sealed and like I'm not a collector who needs items in pristine condition. You may notice that some of the books I buy are secondhand and things like that, but um, if I am going to resell it, then I'd like to have it new rather than just, uh, you know, open it and then not watch it and not get, like, the value. Because I don't want the ring. I don't need any of that stuff. And so I think people would be more willing to buy it if it was still closed up and new, basically. Because it is new. It's just been sitting here on the top of that shelf since I got it. <laughs> Next on the bookcase is a bunch of complete best or final best releases. If you're not familiar with what these are, um, these are kind of CD collections that have the openings and endings for certain franchises, usually like all of the ones that are in um, the franchise. So every season, like, oh, the three seasons openings, the three seasons endings, sometimes um, incidental or like, insert songs as well are included and also they usually come with a dvd or a blu-ray disc that have clean versions of those openings and endings as well so the first one that i have in my collection of these cds is full my alchemist who could have thunk it who who could have ever guessed this is the 2003 anime so the four openings four endings um some which are really great, others that I'm like, eh, that one win ending is a bit eh, but <laughs> overall it's pretty good and uh, yeah, I actually find the openings and endings for the most part really catchy on the old 2003 anime as well. The next one is also Full Metal Alchemist. Oh my goodness, shock, horror, surprise. This is the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Um, the five openings and endings. I usually with these I buy the versions that have the bl uh, the DVD with them mainly because I don't really need the Blu-ray because sometimes you don't have a choice they'll just put it on whatever disc they have but then other times they'll have two versions um, and they're a little bit different price depending on which disc you buy. I didn't mention it with the last um, Set, but these usually come with booklets with the lyrics and some artwork and this particular release has a really nice digipack for the discs so it's a nice little thing that is all put together for a series and again I really like the openings and endings of um, Brotherhood I like all of the openings and endings for Brotherhood in fact um, and they're I mean they look great they sound great and if you're a big dork like me, then it's a great addition to, to have this kind of thing, I think. Next is a somewhat unconventional fan best collection. This is the Noitamine fan be best. If you're not familiar with what, with what Noitamine or Noitamina is, uh, first of all, it's animation backwards, but it's a actual programming block on Japanese television where they, it used to be, and I think nowadays it's kind of returned to form, it used to be where a very niche and kind of unusual anime would have the time slot and um, so it was kind of the time slot for things that wouldn't normally have gotten a television anime if there wasn't this specific um, channel or the specific block on a particular channel. I think the very first series to ever be aired in the uh, Noitamina block was Honey and Clover 
and then shortly thereafter, uh, that show it was twelve episodes in, or twenty four episodes in the second season was twelve episodes. Shortly thereafter, it did turn into a block that only allowed eleven episodes or twenty two, like two core uh, or two season um, length shows, which is why when I was talking about in last video. There are some series like Princess Jellyfish and Ungo and um, uh, Number Six. They were all no Tamane shows, so they only ever had 11 episodes. One of my other favorites, oh, oh, I have a lot of favorites from this particular block. Shiki was another one, Wandering Sun. There, uh, Ping Pong, I believe, also was a no Tamane show. So a lot of very different. Um, unusual kind of things. It did become a little bit more mainstream for a while. Things like, um, most notably was Psychopaths and Guilty Crown, um, but things like Kids on the Slope, Suratama, that, that used to be like its bread and butter, like usual stuff. And more recently, um, we have been seeing more and more uh, again, kind of unusual shows <laughs> come back to this slot. Um, but for this particular release, it was a anniversary kind of celebration thing for a decade of this particular programming block and people. Uh, it was up to individuals, um, fans to vote for their favorite series to, for their openings and endings to be included. So. This includes music from um, both seasons, I think, or at least one of both seasons of Honey and Clover, um, Nodame Cantabile, or um, the earlier, the 2011 um, Kitaro anime, which was another one, um, Eden of the East, Shiki, uh, the Tatami Galaxy, C, the um, Power of Money and Control, whatever that show is, or always called the, the subtitle of that show. Um, Anohana, which again is a very popular one. Number six. Um, Ungo was also included on this one. Um, Guilty Crown, that had um, like egoist openings and endings, so that was understandably very popular. Uh, Suratama, Kids on the Slope, um, Natsuyuki Rendezvous, uh, Psychopaths again, understandable, very popular um, series. <laughs> um, the, uh, what, what's that name of that show called? Samurai Flamenco, a show nobody seemed to like except for like five people and they love it and it's that I haven't even I got to episode seven. I'll I'll finish it one day. I it's a it's definitely a niche that one. Um, Silver Spoon, Ping Pong, uh, Terra and Resonance, and I think that's it. Um, so a lot of shows, a lot of shows. Some of my favorite shows were are aired on this block. Um, as I said, Honey and Clover, Paradise Kiss was another one. Um, uh, the Mononoke and Nodame Cantabile, um, Moyashimon, uh, Hakaba no Kitoro, which is the 2011 Kitoro, Library Wars, I showed off in last video, Antique Bakery, the only ever Fumiyoshinaga title to get an anime, and it's a great anime, um, Eden of the East, uh, Tokyo Magnitude 8.0. Welcome to Erebu's Office, or Trapeze is also its kind of other title. Um, Tatami Galaxy, uh, the anime of House of Five Leaves, which is a Natsune Ono title. Shiki, as I mentioned. Princess Jellyfish, as I mentioned. Uh, Fractal, or Fractal, whatever that show was called. Wandering Sun, of course, my love. I, I adore them. Uh, C, Anohana, Bunny Drop was another one, number six, Ungo, Guilty Crown, uh, Therme Romai was one, and as well as the anime of Black Rock Shooter, Kids on the Slope, Suratama, Natsuyuki Rendezvous, as I said, 
uh, Psychopaths, Robotics Notes, um, which again, Psychopath, like this period of, there's like some that are really weird and off the cuff, like I'm go and you know, that sort of thing. And then Robotics Notes and Psychopaths. Um, Katana Gatari, which is a Nisio Eason title, um, was a Notama no show. Uh, Silver Spoon, as I said. Uh, Galileo, uh, whatever that show is. That, the one, the goldfish, the girls, I don't, I, I never watched it, so. Uh, Samurai Flamenco, Ping Pong, and Nanana's Buried Treasure. Terran Resonance and uh, your name as well um, and raising a girlfriend or whatever that show is so there's like various different levels of like oh wow that's like such a interesting niche weird little title I'm surprised like that I'm surprised that they even got an anime like as I said Ungo or like half of any of those things and then it's like oh yeah okay cool Silver Spoon or Guilty Crown or Psychopaths. Um, it's kind of interesting the type of stuff that came out of this block. I don't remember if they still, if it still exists. It might not. Um, but there, a lot of my favorite shows came out of this particular um, program and uh, I really love it. And thus, I'm pretty happy to have this little set because it has some great music from some fantastic shows. Next is Space Brothers. I love this show so much and it has 99 episodes, so that means it has a bunch of openings and endings. I think it's seven, I can't remember. Um, I love the series so much. You guys saw in my last video the box set that I actually made for this. Really super duper happy that uh, kind of out of the blue we got the prequel film just licensed recently phenomenal series the manga is also available digitally from Kodansha I think there's 35 maybe even 40 volumes out available um highly 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 recommended it is wonderful um I mentioned in the last video it's about two brothers who in childhood they actually see, they believe they spot a UFO and that inspires them to want to become astronauts. And then this is 20, 30 years later and the younger brother has achieved his dream of becoming an astronaut and the older brother is now, after kind of having a, a crisis, getting fired from work and really having no direction in his life, he decides to follow his, his childhood dream of becoming an astronaut and joining his brother in space and working, you know, as an astronaut and, and discovering the, the the great unknown of the space that surrounds us. It's it's a phenomenal, very funny, very heartfelt series, and I I love it. It's super duper good and <laughs> kind of very relatable because the great thing about this particular series is. It's set in a fairly near future, I think it's like 2025, and the older brother, um, as per explained in the intro, w it was born in the same year that I was. I'm like, oh my god, yep. So <laughs> kind of, the, it's under, like for me, I'm like, oh, 2025, where will I be? Like, how will my life have panned out? And that's only five years from now, which is a little bit scary. Uh, <laughs> where will I be at 22, or not 22, 32, 33, I'm just, I'm just, I think I'm a child, I'm not, uh, at 33, a little bit scary to think about, but we'll see. And obviously I haven't gushed about, uh, Not Snow's Book of Friends in the last 20 minutes or so, so I need to, again, yet again, this is the complete best collection or fan best collection, whatever it is, for the first four seasons of Not Somebody's Book of Friends, because this came out before the fifth and sixth and season and the movie came out. So it is not uh, wholly comprehensive, but I'm sure that we will get a, another release with all the songs or more songs. I'm, I highly doubt that we, the series as a whole in anime form is 
finished, the manga is still ongoing. It's the type of show that you can just continually make more and more episodes and the quality of those episodes continues to be fantastic. So I really don't have any doubt that we'll probably see a seventh, maybe even eighth season someday in the next couple of years. <laughs> um, and once that has happened, I feel like they might do another like four season collection. If not, if I'm wrong, they'll put out the other, they will put out a collection for the other two that may even include the songs that are included in this one. And I will happily buy it because, oh my God, if you have not had the pleasure of watching Natsume's Book of Friends 1, go and watch it. It's on Crunchyroll. You owe yourself. Two, the openings and endings. Well, the openings are catchy. Uh, the first one is like probably the, the most like middling of the whole series. From two onwards, they're great. Um, the endings are always like really uh they appeal and like resonate in your heart and they make you feel all soft and warm and like you want to cry but you don't really understand why you want to cry and that's kind of just not the whole series in a franchise anyway it's just wonderful <laughs> and uh they're quiet and beautiful and it's a fantastic show as i continue to say all the time check it out six seasons on crunchyroll but I think this fifth and sixth season are only available in the US and Canada because they're not available in Australia. That's why you use a VPN. Finally is the best of Soul Eater. This doesn't include the... Um, cause, okay, so Soul Eater has, I think, four openings and endings as per usual for a 50 or 52 episode series. For all my problems with Soul Eater, that mainly have to, as I, I talked about this with the show as well, but um, they're mainly like source material problems because, uh, yeah, there's really imbalance of fan service and then like action and drama and that um, it just switches tones a bit too abruptly a lot of the time. I do enjoy Soul Eater, and I li really like the openings and endings of Soul Eater. They're catchy as hell. And, okay, so for those who don't know, back in 2010 or 2011, um, it would have been during 2011, uh, the show, Soul Eater was only probably two or three years old at that point, but they, Bones re-aired the series on some station there's reruns basically uh, which is not like that's not common but it's not like it's kind of understandable but they had new openings and endings like completely reanimated new song with with new songs and things the show was exactly the same they just had different openings and endings or an extra opening and ending something along those lines i don't know why they did that but they did, and that, those are not included on this, which is kind of a shame because they were also catchy and really nice and like fun um, and pretty well done. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of a curiosity there. Don't know why Studio Bones did that, but it is very, very good. And again, it's kind of the thing you listen to and, it, and these openings and endings like get you pumped because it's a shown in action series and not to say that Fullmetal Alchemist um, isn't Brotherhood does have like the, the openings that get you pumped to watch it um, but <laughs> the original not so much because it's kind of a moody drama piece uh, but yeah great great set of songs and really happy to have it on this next shelf we have more CDs um, we do have a couple like collections of openings and endings as well but first and foremost um, I have the opening single to Hunter Hunter 2011 Departure which is the only opening that that show has which is a little bit crazy the animation changes but not the song and this is just the single so it's just the music and I don't think it comes with the uh, I might have a DVD it has a DVD I don't know 
if it's in relation to the animation. The animation changes over the course of the 148 episodes, but not the song, which I know kind of annoyed a lot of people, but not me. I didn't really mind. Uh, then we have the first ending, which is Just Awake by Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Uh, kind of screamo and an interesting choice. And it's a really good ending, just by the way. Uh, then we also have Galnerius, Hunting for Your Dream, which again, the ending, the second ending, pretty good, pretty fun. Uh, then we have the third, the third ending slash, hmm, I think it's, yeah, I think it's the third ending slash, um, movie theme for Phantom Rouge, which is Reason by Yuzu. And I think that has the fourth ending as well. I can't remember. It's been a while. Uh, I haven't rewatched the show in a long time. Uh, and then, hmm, this is for the, the, the film, you can see, Phantom Rouge. This is for, maybe this is for the show? Maybe. Probably. I don't know. I think there's five endings for the show. And this might have the fifth ending. This, this one might have the third and fourth endings. And then this one might have the fifth one. I don't know. Can't remember. It's been a while. Don't quote me. Um... <laughs> Next we have the first soundtrack, which is interesting because it has like a slip case, which just has the same thing underneath it, but we've got that first soundtrack. Then we've got the next soundtrack, which is them. And this one, uh, if you, this slip case, if you take it out, they got like different faces underneath. So there is a change there. It's got like their battle mode or whatever. I don't know what you'd call that. And then you got the third soundtrack, which is just, yeah, that's the difference. I, I mean, what's there to say? I like the music of Hunter Hunter. I like the music of a lot of things. Then we've got the Phantom Rouge soundtrack. A lot of the like movie soundtracks are pretty much the, the show soundtrack. Um, Last Mission, which is the second film. And then what is this? This is like the complete best version of the best soundtrack, not like openings and endings, but the soundtrack music in this one. Um, you got God on the front, Kill on the back, and you can see here is um, character songs. So songs sung by the characters by their voice actors, which are like also a big thing if you're not familiar with um, like music related to anime and CDs you can buy. I tend to not buy a character song just because I'm like, I don't know what they're saying. They're fun to listen to, but they're not like a must have in my collection. But they have the best ones. I think they have Gon, Killua, um, hmm, they've got Ken there who is um, what's his name? The guy. What's his name? The guy. One of the spiders. The punching one. Not the one with bandages. The one where he twists his arm. Oh my god. Finks. Finks. That's his name. Oh my god. That took far too long. Um, there's Larry there. I'm pretty sure there is, um, what's his name? Hisoka. That's his name. I don't know. I haven't checked it in a long time. And it, that's kind of like an interesting to have Ken on there. Hmm. Hmm. Curious. Anyway, yeah. Now for something that people might actually care about, especially when, with regards to music. This is this, I, again, kind of the best collection of uh, soundtrack from Your Lion April. A show that I like, and I like lots of parts of it, but it is kind of very overwrought and melodramatic, and I'm like, well, that was depressing for just 
the sake of being depressing. Uh, I like, as I said, I, there are certainly things I liked about it, but it's not a perfect series in my eyes. Um, I would definitely rewatch it, but I don't currently own the show on disc. The music is beautiful though, which is a good thing because it's about musicians and, and kids trying to become professional musicians. Classical musicians, I must point out, not like rock band musicians. These are, uh, there's a pianist and there's a uh, violinist are our two main characters and kind of the fo main focus of the series is on piano. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, this is a very popular show. I don't think I need to convince people to try it. It is a tearjerker, but like, again, kind of the manipulative-y tearjerker kind of show that I'm like, okay, you made me cry, but I'm not happy about it because it felt like that's all you were trying to achieve with this show. You know what I mean? But it is a great soundtrack. <laughs> Now for a collected um, complete best for a show that me and like three other people know about. This is Skit Dance. Oh my god, guys. Okay, so if you're not familiar, I'm pretty sure this should still be on Crunchyroll, which is where I watched it. It's 75 episodes long. And it, this is a show about a high school club. They're kind of just, they're called the Skit Dan, and they can they're basically like a jack of all trades kind of club people go and ask them for help and they're basically the helpers they try to fix problems in a very goofy and funny they're they're all they're a, a collection of idiots and it works it's very funny very reminiscent of Gintama because the creator was an assistant for the mangaka of Gintama. They were working on Gintama and then went on to do this. This is also the, they would later go on to write uh, Astral Lost in Space, which is a series we have gotten in print and manga wise and obviously has an anime as well now. Um, that's a much shorter series. I think the manga for Sket Dance is 32 or 3 volumes like that, something like that, it's very unlikely to be licensed, unfortunately, unless it's digital only, which I would support. Um, but this, yeah, so <laughs> this is very similar to Gintama, a collection of three kids, two guys and a girl, um, but these are high schoolers, there's no like weird alien things. Um, or any kind of sci-fi element to it, but it's about them and the school and the people they help and run into and the various other students who all have their weird things. And like again with Gintama, it's hilarious and then it gets to some dramatic personal storylines and then you're crying and that was me because you're like, oh, these characters make you laugh and then you learn about their, their dark sad backstory like all of these those humorous kind of long-running manga and and it's effective I was like oh my god how they, oh my god my okay I watched this whole series as it came out with my sister the three episodes about Switch who is this character in the middle with the green like coveralls oh my god he his like well it's not quite the last personal arc but it hits the hardest um our main characters does as well um uh Himiko the girl sh hers is like very good it's done very well but it's I think a little less dramatic and a little less dire than the guises um but they're all good and all of the characters are really good there's a particular character who's introduced a little later on uh, like in the last 20 episodes so I'm like uh, you're unnecessary and because the show didn't run super past that point it never kind of resolved a lot of that which is annoying but it is a really funny show and honestly one that I'd like to see even just like a really bare bones discotheque style release on blu-ray would be like I'd I, I I would buy it. It's this is a really funny show. Husuke and and um they have an owl. They have 
Mm, just a lot of things. And there's... it. I don't know if I watched it now, I would find it as funny, but I do know that I'd probably still find it funny. It's not as crass of humour as Gintama either, so it doesn't have a lot of, like, the raunchy humour that Gintama has, which I think people are like, oh, it's just kind of a pale knockoff of Gintama, which is fair. Like, that's not inherently incorrect, but it is still really fun <laughs> and funny. And uh, I the openings and endings are dang good as well. And for this particular show, they actually formed a band in real life that was based off of a band in the show containing our main characters. And they, after a certain point, did the openings and endings for the show. Like, that's, that's pretty cool. And they, like, persisted for a while. They were still releasing music after the show ended. They're no longer a band, which is... Because this show ended in, like, 2012 or 2013, so it's been a while. Um, but it's... Yeah, it's just, like, such a weird thing that that happened. And they, they were, like, a good band. They were really good. They were... Um, the sketchbook, the sketchbook, um, which was great. It was, uh, <laughs> and also this, ha like, one of the songs is a pillow song, which you may know from Fully Cooley. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, and it's on Crunchyroll. So if you have a Crunchyroll subscription, check it out. It's it's a bit of a goofball series, and if you just want something easy to laugh to, then. This will not disappoint you. Next is Durara um, Best, or Durara Rapping, which has all five openings and endings, including the best, en the best song, which is the first ending. None of the... Okay. I feel like you had to be there, um, and I hate to be one who's like, oh, yes, you... It, it was the moment, like, you, it's not the same afterwards. But when Durara, the first season, was originally airing, it for one, it came out after Bakano. Um, and Bakano wasn't super duper popular. It has a cult following, even now it's... I think, and I think a lot of people do think it's the better of the two series, but uh, Durara, the show, like, really captured people's attention it is the first season is really really great really well paced the second season i said in the last video like it's it has problems it's not as strong as the first season but it is still good to see a lot of the stories wrap up i think it just kind of gets over cluttered there's so many characters and so many plot lines um which is kind of just the basis of naruto's writing um anyway that regardless the first ending the first time I saw the first ending, it was kind of a revelation, okay? It, one, it's a really catchy song, Trust Me, um, that's the name of the song, and also just actually Trust Me, but um, the thing was that it didn't really have a... The, the way it was, was it would scroll the credits, and as the credits were scrolling, like, the characters were also scrolling, and they were kind of in a pile standing on top of each other, so as you went down, you saw, like, all of these characters, and like Bakuno, Durara has 50 million characters, so, like, oh, there's main character, like, there's the three main characters, and then there's Izaya, and, um, the other guy, Shizo, and, uh, like, Selty, and uh, everyone, like, this long scroll of every character who's important, which is pretty much all of them. And that, that ending credit scroll, just like, it, it just became a phenomena. Like with the Caramel Dancing, like, dancing video cartoon thing where everyone's like, oh my god, Caramel Dancing, and then like the little flippy hand dance. Um, wriggle. I, th this is, I don't remember who the first two characters that the first original video had, but that spawned like every version imaginable. You got Death Note Caramel Dancing, you got Toho De Caramel Dancing, you got Final Fantasy Caramel Dancing, you, Oron, every, every Caramel Dancing you could ever 
think of. This is early, not early, but this is like late 2000s internet. So all of you children who were born in like 2005, not that any of you guys really, my knowing my stats, that's not like a huge percentage of my viewers, but for those who the internet you've always had, you've always grown up with, if you weren't in like high school or where what I call high school, but like middle school around my age and you weren't, you weren't familiar with like early fandom internet culture like this, it was a dark time <laughs> for one, but for two, so things, dumb things, Caramel Dancing was huge. Every, every popular show, anything, any popular characters, and it was usually two or three characters. Well, the main character, the main video was two characters, so it was usually only two characters doing a stupid dance to this, this song. And it was like, e there's so many, so many versions. That same thing happened with the ending, the first ending of Jurarara. Because, oh my god, if you had a franchise that had a bajillion characters, like a Kingdom Hearts, or a Final Fantasy, or Hitalia was huge for this. Um, oh, I, again, we're going, we're talking about the cursed days of, like, 2009. Um, my early anime fandom experience, and <laughs> when cringe culture... We enjoyed really cringy things unironically, and now we look back and we're like, oh my god, oh god, why did I do that? And the answer, dear viewers, is that we were young and impressionable, and we we're just super enthusiastic about everything. It's not inherently a bad thing to be cringy when you're young, <laughs> but looking back on it, it is kind of terrifying and very embarrassing. <laughs> But, oh my god, Durara, first ending, trust me, spawned so many copies for any, anything that had lots of characters and that artist, like, artists just jumped on this idea of this. They'd draw all the characters in the same poses and everything and they'd be like, okay, so we have, um, I, I, I'm going to use Hitalia because this is what I'm most familiar with. But it's like, okay, so we got the Axis powers and the, you know, the World Six. And we got, you know, oh, there are Canada's here and um, you know, Lithuania and just like all of them. And they'd be interacting in character like in the ending. They're interacting with each other in character. It's just like a thing. It was just a thing. And now sometimes I feel like if I, if you search... If you search on the in the bellies of deviant art, not where the, like the really weird shit is, but just like the kind of cringy anime shit that was coming out in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, you will find so many versions of like a really it's a really long thing because it's obviously it's meant to be scrolled through of just all of these characters kind of standing on each other's shoulders. And if you haven't seen Dorara, you'd be like, what the, what is this? Why did you do this? Because there's, it's, it, and you, that is the answer. That's the answer. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, the first ending of Dorara kind of became a meme. And it still, regardless, it's the best it's the best ending and the best song in the whole friggin franchise so i mean yeah that's just what it is but <laughs> this particular box set i think i picked it up when i was in japan like i did with solidar and i'm pretty sure i did the same thing with space brothers and the original full Metal alchemist um, I bought whilst I was in Japan, which was in 2015, so almost five years ago now. Um, in about a month it will be five years. So yeah, uh, kind of older disc releases, and I don't buy CDs and soundtracks too, too often, especially anymore. Um, I'm sure that we will get similar releases. I know there's one currently for Haikyuu, but with a new season coming out, I'm just gonna wait. Um, 
And I do keep an eye out for them on occasion. I'm hoping to track down a certain soundtrack sometime for the future, but we'll see if that ever pans out. Nick Shelf only has one thing. Edward from Full Metal Alchemist. We also have, you can see here, Alphonse in the base. This is um, a 1 8 scale figure from Kotobukiya, I want to say. Um, and it did have, uh, this is the kind of limited exclusive version, which comes with this fancy extra bit of the base, all the hands and Al and the creepy faces. And there's a more generic or like wide release which just has Edward and this kind of ground bit here. Uh, like with a lot of figures, he comes with a couple different things. You can change his whole torso, so he's shirtless and with the auto male arm. Um, uh, he also has like a different, I think, grinning face? Uh, he has an alternate head, um, which again, if you are a scale figure collector is especially for exclusive stuff is not that uncommon. Um, a lot of the time you do get alternate faces that are kind of a softer uh, face or like a smiling face or a attack face or something. I don't know, different from um, the general. And so, yeah, I mean, I, to the surprise of no one, I'm a big fan of Full Metal Alchemist. How many times have I said it already in this, this, collection uh marathon <laughs> a lot of times up until recently because this was only re released in probably a year or so maybe two years ago now we really didn't have a lot of merchandise especially figure wise of full metal alchemist that was high quality there's quite a few kind of you know magazine gift things and there was a lot of um I want to say like cheaply made kind of action figure type things that were very easily bootlegged. A lot of toy or um, prize figures type of deal, um, gachapon things, you know, that style of figure. But we really didn't have a nice scale figure until very recently. We didn't even have Nendroids until this year slash last year, which is kind of crazy considering how beloved this franchise is and it I mean it is nice that we've gotten I think I think there's pluses and minuses because for one I think the technology and the materials now currently in use for making figures scale figures is has vastly improved since the early days which is why, um, like, because it used to be that the, the actual sculpting or the paint job or whatever wouldn't necessarily be super duper high quality. And a lot of the time, if they were kept in their box, they'd get sticky because, um, you know, the plastic would sweat pretty much. Uh, now, that's not really so much of an issue, not as much issues with leaning and sorts of things. I mean, it depends on the sculpt, it depends on the manufacturer and all of that. But I think it is nice that, especially for the Nendroids, which is like my first thought, old Nendroids are kind of not wonderful when you look at them now. They're pretty, not cheap looking, but they're kind of simple and basic and they do almost all of them suffer from stickiness. You have to kind of wash them on a somewhat regular basis, um, which is not wonderful. Um, and in fact, now we've actually seen a re-release or we're getting a re redo, reboot kind of thing for the Death Note Nendroids, which were like some of the very, very first Nendroids that were ever released, um, which is kind of cool. And so now in Android form, we have Edward, Alphonse, Roy Mustang, um, Envy is coming. I'm pretty sure Hawkeye is coming, Risa. Um, I don't think there's any else, but that's, I mean, that's five more than, than, than there's ever been. 
And I'm just really happy that I, I don't, you'll see some Nendroids in the collection, but I don't actually actively buy Nendroids. Uh, because I don't pose them enough or play around with them enough to think they're worthwhile for me. But they are very cute. And it's nice that they are now, after forever, after a million years, available. Um, and I'm really happy that this particular figure, for me, who does prefer scale figures, is around. And it is, it looks good. It looks like the character is painted well and it's really fancy and includes a lot of things that I particularly like in scale figures. It's dynamic, which is not, not always the case for male figures. You may have noticed, um, not so much in my collection, but a lot of them are like, oh, I'm just standing with a school uniform on and I don't even look like I'm doing anything. I'm just posing for the camera and it's not even a cool pose. This one doesn't have that issue. And quite a few of my figures, there are, I mean, you will notice the standing boy figures, <laughs> especially in comparison. Not that I have a huge amount of female figures uh, either, but the dynamic dynamicism of female figures, I think is a lot wider than uh, the few male figures that we get and the poses that they're put in. Hey, look, we've reached the Ghibli. Um, so I have the hope to own every single Ghibli film that has ever been released. And I'm pretty much there. Um, I own all of them except for one and another one, which I have Okay, so I own all of the films except for The Cat Returns, um, just because it's kind of the lowest priority film for me, and I refuse to own Ocean Waves because I freaking hate that movie a lot. Um, I only watch it once, and it's still such a negative impact. I'm just like, oh, I don't ever want to watch it again. The, the female character in that, like, I understand why she was written the way she is, but oh, it was not infuriating to watch. Anyway, this is not about Ocean Waves, this is about the rest of Ghibli, which is, I think, universally accepted as being very wonderful, uh, whimsical and lovely and just perfect kids films. Um, the way I, you can, you can tell these are all uh, the Australian releases, Madman's logo is right here, the ratings logo is right there. The reason I chose the Australian releases when I w decided to s start buying these was because a very consistent style. They all look pretty much the same. They have the white spine with the logo, the stylized logo. Um, they have double-sided artwork. So on the inside is an alternate cover and it's actually the a, an alternate Japanese cover. It has the title in Japanese and it's a nice bit of different artwork. It also comes with an insert that has like information about it. It's only one page and then on the other page on the other side of it is kind of the release dates of all of the these films via the year they came out. So um, it was kind of a no-brainer for me to buy them locally. They're I mean they were easier for me to find as well and I just like consistency. Consistency where I can get it is a great thing. So I have also organized these via release date. So we have the very first film, Nosca of the Valley of the Wind, which is not even technically Ghibli, but Hayao Miyazaki's first film in so far as like his new studio. It came out kind of as he was establishing Ghibli <laughs> as, as a studio and himself as a, a, the head of a studio. Then we have Lafta Castle of the Sky, um, just castle in the sky if you're in the US because of bad words in Spanish. Um, but not here, we don't have that. <laughs> we don't have that worry. So we have the full name, another Miyazaki work. Next to that is the first of Asao Takahata's films for Ghibli, and that is Grave of the Fireflies. Of course, the heartbreaking wartime drama about two siblings. Then we have My Neighbor Totoro, another Miyazaki film. I mean, everyone knows Totoro. It, Totoro is the mascot of Ghibli. Like you, 
you'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't know Totoro. Next to that is Kiki's Delivery Service, another Miyazaki film which is very sweet, very cute, very um, very nice kind of low-key coming of age story with a bit of magical realism to it. Then we have Only Yesterday which is another Isao Takahata film which I really like but like with all of Takahata's films don't have the wide child appeal that Miyazaki's films do. Um, they do uh, tend to appeal to a older audience and this particular one is about a woman in her late 20s I believe who goes to um, the countryside to kind of get a new perspective on her life and reflect on her childhood which is obviously not something that kids are super duper interested in but it is a wonderful film. Next to that is Porco Rosso which is about an Italian uh, fighter plane pilot who was cursed and now is a pig. <laughs> um, it's a fun series and kind of the first inkling, I mean Noska and Lapta and Kiki, all, I would say that it's not really a secret that Miyazaki likes flying but this is the first time he put planes explicitly in his films and have his protagonist explicitly flying planes. Next up is Pompoko, which is another Takahata film. This is about a group of mischievous tanuki who are trying to fight against a uh, land development in their area, in their, you know, forest. It's, it's weird. Um, <laughs> which is kind of what you should expect when you're watching a film about tanuki. Um, but not for everyone. It's just kind of a riot, honestly. Next to that is my absolute favorite, and this is kind of a strange, considering all of the Ghibli films that so many people love, uh, this next film is not neither a, a, a Sao, Isao Takahata or Miyazaki film. This is Whisper of the Heart by Yoshifumi Kondo. I love this film so much and it is my favorite of the Ghibli films. Um, yeah, it's kind of incredible. I, I found it right when I needed it, I think, and this is about a middle schooler who doesn't really know what to... She doesn't have any motivation in her life. She doesn't have a dream for anything. And after following a cat on, from, uh, on a train, she finds herself at an antique store and she... She also finds out that uh, one of her classmates works there or her, his grandfather runs the place and he has a dream. He wants to go to Italy to study how to make violins, um, which is kind of like an incredible, fantastical dream that is absolutely attainable, but like it takes a lot of hard work. And so he kind of inspires her to start looking for her own Thing that she, her own passions, her own dream that she might want to achieve, and her particular uh, dream and goal is writing, which for any of you guys who don't know, I hopefully, fingers crossed because exam marks come out today, have just finished a, <laughs> a degree focused on professional writing and publishing. So yeah, very, very relative to my own experience and my own goals in life. But it's a beautiful movie. I love it so, so much. And it, it is kind of one of the lesser known Ghibli films. And it, it it's the screenshot, there's a screenshot from this film that's used for all those like, 24 hours non-stop lo-fi hip-hop beats for studying uh, streams that you see on YouTube. Um, the picture in that comes from this movie. <laughs> Just a bit of random trivia for you there. Um, okay, then we have Princess Mononoke, another Miyazaki film, another beloved film, wonderful. Um, and again, like with Noska, like with Laputa, like with uh, Totoro as well, this one is very obvious in Miyazaki's environmentalist messages, which is 
good. That's good stuff to be teaching kids. Uh, next to that is My Neighbors the Yamadas by Takahara. This I think is one of my favorites, my sister's favorite Ghibli films. And it's like such a weird one because um, I think it's based off of a kind of a newspaper strip in Japan that us plebs who don't live in Japan, us normies, wouldn't ever have ever known and we don't like really have any reference to it but it's kind of a sequence of short kind of newspaper gags of this family you know mum dad kids and their day-to-day -day lives but like there's a lot of shenanigans that goes on I don't know <laughs> it's an interesting one and it kind of, and I like Takahata's films a lot for the personality he puts into them and they feel a lot more grounded um, and thus a little bit more mature for an older watcher versus Miyazaki's. Of course, I mean, now that's not to say that Miyazaki's films are bad or that they're only for children or whatever else. Don't twist my words, that's not what I'm saying. But I do think that as an older fan and as an older watcher, and for someone coming into a lot of these films as someone who is in their late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, that um, a lot of Takahata's films appealed to me directly in my experiences more than kind of the magical hopefulness of many of Miyazaki's kids films, which I do love and are amazing and beautiful, but are just like, they're, they are kids films and they're for kids and um, that doesn't make them any less valuable. That doesn't mean they're not fantastic, but it just the messages seem less relevant for me and my point in life compared to Takahata's. That makes sense. I've already talked about Natsume. I've already talked about Fullmetal Alchemist. I've already gushed over all of my favorites. So needless to say, it would be a miss if I did not gush over my other favorite that being free <laughs> you know how I said earlier in this video that I don't really buy character songs because I'm just they don't really appeal to me a huge amount I don't understand them and um you know they're just kind of a bit of a extra that I personally don't don't invest in it's not that it was a lie necessarily but it wasn't taking into account my burning love for all of the say of the free franchise. <laughs> so first and foremost, we have these two particular rubber straps, uh, Makoto and Haruka from free, obviously. These were exclusive ones that came with, um, they were, okay, they were both shop exclusives um, to a particular rubber strap box set. Um, so you got Haru at one store if you bought the set and then you got Makoto um, with the set uh, as an additional set if you bought it at another store. So um, like a crazy person, uh, I bought two sets <laughs> from two different stores so I could have these two because I'm not going to deny it. I love these two. They are my OTP for the show and they are very precious to me. I don't... I don't agree to disagree for all the Rin horrors in the chat. I, I don't hate Rin. Don't at me like that. I just, I am, I am weak. I am weak to childhood friends and I am weak to characters who are ba basically golden retrievers in human form. And I am weak to just soft boys who are also just very big I eat Makoto Tachibana. I'm just, I just, uh, I just love Makoto Tachibana. Just leave me alone. I love him. I love him. And, and I, I, their friendship is so important to me and I, I want them to be in love. Let's just, let's just say that, okay? That I'm exposing myself to the masses, but everybody knew anyway, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> so I have those two there. These these rubber straps, also if you don't know, because you're not a crazy free fangirl like me, these particular rubber straps are based off of an end card artwork from the first season where the boys 
are at Marco's house playing video games in his bedroom eating popsicles. But I mean, there's, uh, of course I was going to buy them. Why? Of course I was going to spend the money on the same thing twice just to have these little bits of rubber that I don't even take out of this room. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't really go hard on fangirly merchandise an awful lot, but free is the exception. I mean, I have a couple exceptions, but free knows that they can get their my money. They know they can merchandise things and I will buy it. KyoAni is brilliant because they put... Okay, we'll see more KyoAni merch for this franchise later. I'm not going to get into it because I'm going to get into it when we get to it. Uh, let's just say they they are brilliant. They can They take my money every year, even when there's no free anime coming out. How they manage that? Who knows? <laughs> brilliant marketing. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, so this first box is actually a collection of character singles. You can see all three of them. They are five. I might say three. Five. These are the five main characters, so I'll take them out. The box as well is a store exclusive thing that in Japan, if you bought the CDs from one place uh, with the last one, you would have gotten that box or the first one. I don't know. I don't remember. Um, obviously, I'm not in Japan, so I bought the sets secondhand from people who had done that in Japan. So we have the first one, which is Haruka Nanase, obviously, main character of the franchise. Um, also, you will notice here, look, okay, you got um, the the swim lanes, and then you got like, oh, look, he's number one, because this is the first CD, and all of these different, and it, this will change. So um, yeah, I, I really love Zaki. Um, Nobunaga Shimazaki, this, his seiyu, he, he's a good boy, he's a sweetheart, I love him, and this was really the role that I paid attention to him in, because I didn't, he wasn't really that popular up until that point, he's been in a lot of stuff since, he's been in a whole lot since, people who follow current anime, he's, um, Yuki in The New Fruits Basket, I mean, that's probably his most recent role. Um, he's in a lot of stuff. You will know him. If you watch Japanese, um, you know, with subtitles, you've heard his voice. I'm pretty sure he was in... I want to say he was Ujio in Sword Art Online. I didn't watch that season, so I may be wrong, but I feel like that's correct. He's been in a lot of stuff. You, you know him. You know him. Uh, but yeah, Zaki, love him. He's a very good actor. Then we got, then we got my boy, I my my one true love, I say. Um, this is um, Tatsun as Makoto Tachibana, and you can see. Look, okay, again, number two. See the go down the swim lane. I'm like, oh, attention to detail. Um, but yeah, so all of them, they're just like a plain CD, and then they got the end. You can see here, it's Tatsuhisu Suzuki, so Tatsun, who also, coincidentally, if you don't know, is the vocalist for, um, what is their name? The oh, Am I gonna, um, Old Codex, that's correct, isn't it? Brain, please don't fail me. Um, but the, the band who does all of the openings for free, he's the vocalist. It's his band, and his singing voice and his actual voice is, like, very different from this good boy, this good boy voice. Um, so yeah, you know, thank And then we got the other main character, kind of the antagonist, but not really for the first season. We got Rin Masoka, who is my boy. Like, I, I, I've already mentioned Mamu, Mamoru Miyano. Yeah, that's this guy, and I love him, and... We've already, we've already gone into my love for Mamo-chan, right? He, it, he makes, okay, if anyone else voiced this character in any of the seasons, but especially the first season when he's a major asshole for like a solid 85% of it, you wouldn't like him. You wouldn't want him to get redeemed. But Mamo-chan makes it possible. He, 
he's able to do the impossible. And yeah, all of these, um, I don't know if I pointed this out, but it has two songs and then like the, the non-vocal, just the music version of those songs. Why you want to listen to that, I don't know. Maybe for karaoke. Who knows? Um, yeah, so then we have Nagisa uh, Hazuki, who is the fourth member and also like the guy. Um, he's the, you know, the cutie of the club. He's the underclassman. And uh, if you haven't seen the show, <laughs> um, and he's kind of the one who encourages Haru and Makoto to start the swim club. And he's the one who wants to get everyone swimming together again. Um, this is Tsubasa uh, Yonaka. Yeah, Wing. I call him Wing. Um, I mean, his fans call him Wing anyway, so I'm not the only one. Um, he is actually on hiatus slash maybe retiring. Um, he has a certain throat issues currently, so I know he's only working on some of his sort of legacy characters, things that are already coming out, characters who he's already voiced before, but uh, he's put a lot of his work on hold um, just the, these last couple months. Get better soon, because you, you have a great voice, and I love you. And also his character is a goofball. He is a goofball. And then finally for the main cast, <laughs> we have uh, Daisuke Hirakawa as Rei Ryu, Ryu Gazaki, who is, um, again, if you haven't seen the show, he's like the newcomer to the group of friends. Um, he had never swum before the show started and kind of doesn't like the idea of swimming. But then, um, like everyone in Haru's life, he is inspired by the beauty of his crawl stroke and thus wants to join their relay team. And uh, yeah, it... Mm, he got done dirty in the first season. But, again, I said the second season is my favorite. The way they resolved that was friggin' a good thing. And I'm glad that Kyoani didn't do... They gave my boy his dues. And he deserves all the dues. So yeah, that was the first five. And, uh... Obviously, I have a lot of feelings over fictional swimmers, but let's be honest, we all knew that. That's the first of those, and that is the first thing on these shelves, and really the only thing on these shelves. But you can see, kind of in the bottom of the frame here, that this is not all of these boxes that I have. <laughs> so, onward to the next shelf. Welcome to the next shelf, where G continues to gush over... Japanese voices as they sing. Um, so this top one is related to the first season. I also didn't mention, but the one above is all of the character songs from the first season, which is Iwatobi Swim Club. Free Iwatobi Swim Club, um, or season one. This box is a little bit different from the past box. You can see different artwork. This is not a character single collection. This is a character duet collection. Okay, kids. Um, so, the first one being my boys, loves of my lives, in whom I'm incredibly invested in. We got Mark and Haru, um, and their songs are great, as per expected for childhood friends who understand each other and everything about... Oh, oh! So yeah, kind of an expected um, pairing for a character song. It's the first one in the series and it's understandable that it is because these two are best friends and do everything together. They even have identical phones because Haru, Haru refuses to learn how to use a phone and he will only get a phone if his best friend has the same phone so that he can teach him how to use his own fucking phone. Yeah, so anyway. And this one has, um, three... No, it has two songs, and then um, it has a drama, like a character drama. So basically, like, there's a scenario, and they're talking to each other. Pretty sure the drama is them trying to cook something, because Haru's a good chef, Mahoto is useless in the kitchen, and uh, so Haru's, like, trying to teach him not to burn a house down every time he turns on the stove, which doesn't go as well as hoped. 
Next in <laughs> the character singles is um, Nagisa. Oh my God, Nagisa and Ray, who again are kind of like often paired together. They're the two first years of the first season. Be uh, quickly become best friends and are just very sweet and um, a very like comedic duo insofar as like Nagisa will do something annoying but he'll do it just because he knows that it'll annoy Ray and then Ray will be like oi and he'll and Ray is like he's a straight arrow he he's he's very informed about a lot of things and he's very analytical about everything that he does and he he strives for perfection and beauty in his life and he's very like he likes to be able to share knowledge to other people and then is the kind of guy who's like oh I'm gonna have donuts for breakfast and then um, we're gonna stay up all night watching um, friends reruns and also let's paint our nails at 3 a.m. in the morning they're, so they're kind of the odd duo and I love them we all we everyone loves them I don't remember what the drama was for this one. Shenanigans. Shenanigans, obviously. Very obviously. Next is for people who maybe haven't seen the show. show and uh, also, like, it's kind of unusual for the first season, but not so much uh, later on in the series. We have Rin and Ray, uh, which these two are like, quite similar in personalities. Um, or at least they value the same thing and they they swim the same stroke which is probably why they were paired together there is conflict between these two conflict in the first season so that's probably why they're paired together here oh look at Ray trying to learn how to swim look at that little boy um, but yeah so another 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 and then finally <laughs> the main event the two I mean, the greatest rivalry of the whole franchise. Unsurprising that it's last. And also, I mean, if we're, if we're going into fandom stuff, this is like Makaharu, which are my, my favorite boys kissing boys in the, in the show. Uh, nobody kisses anyone in the show, so just I'll be upfront about that. But those are the two that I'm like, yes, they, I want them to be in love. The next one, uh, which is Rin and Haru, are the other ones it's it's basically the difference between do you want the childhood friend pairing or do you want the the rivals for life pairing which are also kind of childhood friends but not as much of childhood friends they're both very easy tropes to get latched to and thus fandom could never be happy and always had flame wars but who nah that's just normal fandom mama chan i I mean, I, I, lo I love Rin. He's a great character. I'm not, I'm not getting into fandom drama here because I love all of the boys equally. I just don't want, I, don't, I just ship different things, guys. Next, <laughs> in the next box, we have character singles yet again. Here, ugh, and ugh. These are the, again, five for the main characters. This is for season two. This, by the way, we got Haru. We got Makoto, we got Rin, no, you, um, you always gotta put Rin third because he's like not on the same swim team but he's still like one of the main characters, um, almost more so than Makoto, I'm, well I mean, I, mm, yeah, then we got Nagisa and then we got Rei and then then you will see that there's another box and no this I don't remember if this season had character duets I don't think it did this is not character duets this is for the additional new characters some of which were in the first season like my this boy and then new character new character um yeah so we got these are okay so I also haven't explained it in this um this video but in free the main characters are the Iwatobi swim club kids who are these kids so we got Makoto, Haru, Nagisa, Rei and then uh, Rin is Makoto, Haru's and Nagisa's childhood friend who moved to Australia when 
he was 12. Um, and he came back to Japan to finish high school. And um, when he did, he goes to a rival school, which actually has a really strong swimming team. So um, now with these new character singles, they are his teammates at Samazuka, which is the Iwotobi's rival, basically. Uh, rivals, but they're all like friends. They're all buddies. So this is... Okay, so in the second season, KyoAni, they knew... They knew the shit that was happening. They knew that everybody had, was shipping everybody else. And they knew that Rin, Rin Haru and Marco Haru fans were having a literal war. And they knew that everyone was weak for childhood friends and rivals and all of these things. And then season two, they're like, we're genius. We're, we're genius. We're going to even capitalize. It might, it might cause... Um, the fandoms to become, I mean, they're still Rin Hara fans, and that, yay, I'm happy for you guys. Um, but this character introduced an additional new character who was a childhood friend and could kind of break up the, the fact that the two main pairings were centered around the main character. It kind of gave an extra character to not... Anyway, another childhood friend, we got Sosuke Yamazaki, who is Hosoda, Hosoyan, um, who you will know as Otterbeck from, um, what's it called, Uran Ice. He is in a lot of stuff, again, like, he is in everything. Uh, you know him if you watch things subtitled. He is Rin's childhood friend from before he knew, from before Rin knew Haru and and Makoto and them so he's like again he's kind of like the the Rin Rin's version of Makoto so he came and it's like people were oh yay more childhood friends and thus some some of the fighting was abated not forever but somewhat then we have Nitori my sweet boy Aichiro um who is an underclassman in the first season he is Rin's roommate and he kind of looks up to him but it, oh man Rin is so mean to him also this particular say he's you know he he sounds like a little baby child I mean look at that face he looks like a little baby child he's like 40 um I'm like how do how do you do that with your voice sir how are you able to do that with your voice I don't know one of life's great mysteries but he's a great actor. And I'm... Nishiri gets his dues as well. Kyoani never, never fails to make everyone be happy and get the things they deserve. And they deserve the world because they're all good children. And then finally we have Momotaro um, Mikoshiba, who is a new character. I mean, so is Sosuke. But he is a first year, um, so new to the school. He's the younger brother of the previous captain of Samazuka, and he's now Nishiri's current roommate, now that Rin and Sosuke are roommates. It's a, it's a, it's a thing. So he's just, he is kind of the extra person to make the relay team for Samazuka. He, pl he does backstrike? Pretty sure it's backstrike. Yes. Would have to be. Would have to be. Logical deduction, because... Nishiri, yeah, he is backstroke, Nishiri is breaststroke, um, Sosuke is butterfly, and Rin is freestyle, or crawl stroke, as um, they like to call it, uh, which is, I mean, that's the technical name for it, but who calls it crawl stroke? I don't know, not me. I'm not a weirdo. Then next to them, we have some of the soundtracks. We have um everblue sounds which is season one soundtrack great soundtrack then we have clear blue notes which is season two soundtrack i mean again great soundtrack and then we have oh pure blue scenes which is uh the film soundtrack well the high speed film soundtrack we got more boys every time 
you got to introduce more boys. But look at all their little baby children. This is the film that sat in middle school. And it's like, I, I said it before, Kiwani, they do a really good job with their movies. Even their recap movies for these the this franchise is like amazingly good. I'm like, how why do you put so much effort into the recap films? It's it's you new scenes, they're so good. I love them. What the hell? Anyway, yeah, so that is I mean, I'm not gonna say that's all of the free music that I have because it's not. That would be a lie. But that is a vast majority of the free music that I have. And yeah, kind of expose myself as the, the big fangirl shipper, shipper that I am and used to be. And, uh, but that's fine. Why live a lie? This is my channel. I've got to be myself. And thankfully, most people accept that. <laughs> Hey look, we've gotten to something that people actually care about. Um, this is the second half of my Ghibli collection and pretty much everything that Ghibli has. The only one, as I said earlier, is The Cat Returns um, Missing, which is why there's a gap right there. But I have Spirited Away. Of course, everybody knows that it won an Oscar. It's kind of the most famous Ghibli film of all time ever and one that even non- anime fans are aware of so yeah you know what what more can i say after that is house moon castle uh loosely based off of the novel of the same name the novel is very very good i highly recommend it the film is also very good but not for the reasons that the novel is good and they really don't have a huge amount in common aside from there's a wizard called Howl, and sophie is the main character and like the premise is the same, but the events are not the same. So um, don't go into that expecting a really accurate adaptation of the novel. I would encourage you to read the novels if you like the film. And in a similar vein, uh, Tales from Earthsea, people call it the worst Ghibli film. No, that's not true. That would be Ocean Waves. <laughs> no, but this is uh, this actually isn't that bad. I know that um, Le Guin... Ursula Le Guin, the, no the author of the Earthsea novels, um, hated this book, or ha hated this movie. It's not really, I mean, it's kind of based on the Earthsea world. It has characters who are meant to be her characters, but I can understand why, as a creator, this isn't what she regards as being her work, because it's not. Uh, I do think that people are overly critical of it, though. Um, this is Goro Miyazaki's first film, um, and that, if you're not aware, that is Hayao Miyazaki's son. So I think there was expectations for him to be, you know, brilliant like his father, but, um, you know, it's not bad. There's some beautiful moments in it. The music is great, but it's not, it isn't an Earthsea no, like it's not an adaptation of an Earthsea novel. It has dragons. It has kind of low-key magic. Um, and so, okay, for full disclosure, I am a huge Earthsea fangirl. I've I've said I'm a fangirl about a lot of things, but I grew up on Earthsea. I'd recently just reread Earthsea because I was missing it so much. And I went out and bought um, the new nice hardcover illustrated release of releases of the first four books um, because I, for some reason, somehow don't don't have copies in in my book shelves. Um, it's she, Le Guin is a incredible writer. Her prose is phenomenal and. The story of Earthsea, the themes of Earthsea, the whole cycle is amazing. It's it's so good. And if you haven't read them, they are, um, especially the first three, are kind of regarded as YA novels. They are for young people. I would highly encourage you to read them. They're short. They're only about 200-ish pages. Do yourself the favor, especially if you like fantasy. The 
it's kind of Earthsea is kind of regarded as being the birthplace of YA fantasy, at least in so far as it invented the idea of a magic school, which obviously now people are like, oh, Harry Potter, like it's just a staple in um, YA fantasy. She invented that. Um, and the school really doesn't have a huge amount to do with the story in Earthsea, but like the fact that that is so lasting within people's awareness of YA fantasy now is pretty, pretty cool. But this is a loose adaptation. I mean, kind of like cherry picks ideas from the third book um, and the fourth book, which um, is an interesting choice <laughs> um, because it doesn't, like, if you were doing an actual adaptation, which also, by the way, for any uh, other Earthsea fans out there, I'm sure you know, but we're getting a TV adaptation um, soonish, hopefully, and I have great hope for it because, man, none of the, all of the adaptations of Earthsea up to this point have been not Earthsea. Oh my god, let's not get started on the TV movie. Oh boy, that was so bad. Um, I mean, people say this is a bad adaptation of Earthsea, and it's not a good adaptation, but it's better than the TV movie. Let's just put it that way. If you're not familiar with the six books of Earthsea, and the first is A Wizard of Earthsea, the second is Tombs of Atuan, the third is The Farthest Shore. Um, the fourth, which was written many years later um, and kind of regarded by the author at the time as the final book of Earthsea, which is not just by the way, um, is Tehanu. So it's the furthest, the farthest shore and Tehanu that a lot of the ideas are plucked from for this film. And for anyone else uh, that the additional books are The Tales of Earthsea. Um, or Tales from Earthsea, which is kind of a collection of short stories, uh, most notably one called Dragonfly, which is crucial for understanding the final book, which is The Other Wind. A uh, beautiful, beautiful series, phenomenal, and a, really unlike a lot of stuff in the genre. Anyway, <laughs> so in The Farthest Shore, our main character is a, is a young prince called Aaron who travels to find the Grand Mage, the Grand Master Mage, um, who is our main character in the first and second, first book, notably, and he's very important for the second and third book. And he is, I mean, it's his story. It, he's the main character. Our main character is Ged. Um, who over the course of the series becomes Grandmaster Mage, not really a spoiler, uh, because it's, it, it's told to us explicitly in the prologue of book one. Um, <laughs> but the whole series is kind of his life from a childhood up until, you know, him in his seventies. So be, being, uh, kind of this bright young wizard, um, up until adulthood where he is a Grand Mage up until much later in his adulthood where he becomes sort of the the master teaching younger apprentices being the the guide for others which is kind of his role in tales in in this movie because Ged is in there in this but he is his adult self we also have our main character main female character from Tombs of Atuan who is her adult self which is the case in the fourth book, um, the third and fourth book. Uh, so I feel like the ideas that were chosen for this movie were done so because it would allow us to have teen characters, a teen main character, but also have... Uh, it would also feature the main beloved characters of the franchise, if that makes sense. Uh, because this isn't a, this isn't really Ged's story. This is Aaron's story, which is the third novel. It is Aaron's story, but 
we also have Tehanu um, in this book or in this movie, who, who is in the fourth book, um, being raised by Teru, who is the protagonist of the second book. Um, and there's, okay, it's hard to explain because for, for this magic world, world, magic is done via what's known as the old speech, the speech, the original language, the language of truth and sort of the, the language of dragons. So, um, you know, the world, the world, the archipelago of, um, of Earthsea uh, has its own languages, but all magic is done with the the true speech or the old speech. Um, and there's a huge aspect of society within the Earthsea novels where people have a used name, they have a childhood name, they have a used name, and then they also have a true name that they are given once they reach adulthood which is like 12, 13. Um, oh my God. I'm trying to get my bottle of water and I, I'm sitting a little bit too far away. Anyway, but um, so Ged is, Ged is his true name, but most characters, his used name is Sparrowhawk um, and various iterations of Hawk. So the idea of a true name is something that you don't share with other people. It is your true self and thus it should be protected. And um, it's very, like you only really tell, you might not never tell someone your true name over the course of your life. And uh, so there, like, there's a lot of aspects to the magic within the novels that are just not really shown or explained at all in this film, which I think makes it a little bit dense to kind of try and figure out what might be trying to say, you know? Um, I know I'm just talking about this one movie, but I don't care. This is my video and you decided to click on it, so I'm just going to talk about it as much as I want. <laughs> um, especially because Earthsea is a really important series to me and it is so phenomenal. and. It's, this film is not a good Earthsea novel or adaptation, but it's not, it's not a bad movie. If you just take it as a generic fantasy movie, then it works better rather than expecting it to capture just the majesty and, and all of everything that the novels were trying to do. Because it's not going to do that. Because also, like, I say that this takes ideas from the third and the fourth book, which it does, that's not a lie, but the third and the fourth book have, like, a long, the fourth book happens pretty much immediately after, uh, the events of the fourth book happen towards the tail end slash after the, the third book. So the events are somewhat in line, but they, in this film, they age up Tehanu a lot so that she's kind of a teenage, like kind of the same age as Aaron, so that can have like a somewhat romantic kind of angle, which is not the case. Because she's a little girl in the fourth book. And in the sixth book, which is when she shows up again, there's, there's a solid, because in the third book, Aaron is probably 17, 16, 17, maybe a little bit younger, but he's a teenager. Um, Tanu is like eight years old in the fourth book. So, I mean, they, when you get older, that's not a huge amount of age difference, but when you're young, that's a huge amount of age difference. So I don't, like, I can understand why that choice was made, but I don't know why they needed a romance. Well, may, I don't know. Just, uh, they did a lot of interesting choices in that movie. But it is still a, it's a solid movie for what it is. It's just not really 
an Earthsea movie, um, aside from having characters with the same name, and also dragons. Spot for um, The Cat Returns, uh, as I said. Next to that is Ponyo, which honestly... Um, I, it's sweet, it's cute, it's definitely a film made for little kids. Like, little, little kids. Um, when this movie first came out, my friends were very into it, because at the same time, they went to Japan with the school and language exchange, and during their trip, the music, the, the, the song... Um, was playing everywhere. So that was like the theme of their language ex- exchange. I was like, okay, okay, cool. Like it was, and then when I watched it, I was like, I don't think I like this a whole lot. Um, it grew on me slowly over years. Um, but it's not like, even like compared to Tales from Earthsea, that's a movie made for like, Preteens and teenager, like there's some action and adventure. Ponyo is for very little kids, um, but it is still fun. It is still magical, and uh, it just has like a five-year-old as the protagonist, which is fine. Um, next to that is Arietti by Hiromasa Yonabayashi. <coughs> Pardon me. This is an adaptation of the novel The Borrowers. Uh, again, not really a real adaptation, it just kind of is loosely based off of The Borrowers. It's not pulling any actual storyline from the novel, from what I remember. It's just, uh, it features a, a world or a society of tiny, tiny people. Um, I'm pre- okay, so this movie, I'm gonna get into some of it. This movie was initially released in the UK. On disc, they had a dub, a uh, British dub, and it's all really nice and fancy. And it had, um, it had a a cinema release with the dub, as most Ghibli films tend to do. Just in general, I don't really need to say that to you guys. Um, and in Australia, when the initial Blu-ray slash DVD release came out it featured that British dub. Then, like, two years later, or 18 months later, I don't know why it took so long, in the US, they also had their screenings, their cinema screenings, and they also dubbed the film. Although there was already a dub that existed, and I'm sure there was probably a reason as to why they didn't just use the British dub, but... It meant that two dubs exist for this film that came out within like one year of each other. It's really weird. And then, so the US release, Blu-ray release, has a different dub from the UK release. And then the Australian release got like a special edition kind of, and they, it has both dubs. So I can choose which dub I want to listen to. I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure... Um, okay, so it has... Um, Sarazi Ronan as Arietti in the British version. Um, and, oh my god, so many Brits I know. But then, like, Amy Poehler and Will Arnett are in the U.S. dub. I am pretty sure that the boy, that this boy, our main human character, is voiced by Tom Holland. I might be incorrect, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. Who, for anyone who doesn't know, one, this movie came out before, like, He was famous. But for anyone who doesn't know, he's the Spider-Man. He's the new Spider-Man in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's the, he's the, um, what's his name? Peter Parker. Spider-Man. Um, so it's just, like, kind of weird. It's like, oh my god, Spider-Man is an Arietti. But this is before he was Spider-Man. This is before he kind of blew up in popularity. I'm pretty sure he was still doing stage 
stuff. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure he still does stage stuff, but that's where he got his start for people who don't know. Um, next one is from Up on Poppy Hill, which is a very good movie. Um, this is Goro Miyazaki's second attempt at directing, um, and it was heavily oversight by his father because he's like you're not going to shame me and our family name again with a mediocre film um this is an interesting one it's set in uh japan post-war and is about kind of the changing society in the lead up to the 1964 olympics and two high schoolers who kind of have to navigate the changing society and their feelings for each other. It's a solid little uh, little film. Although there's some twists that kind of make you a little bit nervous if you're like me and have issues with certain things. Um, and just that issues and so far as I just don't want to be reading about that or watching that. Thankfully, they are not fulfilled. <laughs> then is Miyazaki's a uh, self-described final film, which is a big fat lie. Um, but it is it has been his last film as of ye so far. Um, the Wind Rises. Um, is this is I. This is an interesting film because even at the time, I think there's a lot of conflict about whether or not this story would be good to be coming out of such a beloved studio like Ghibli you know okay so if you don't know The Wind Rises is a is sort of a biography about a particular man who loved flying who, who loved planes and he actually designed a plane which later or during his time of his lifetime but he was a, a aero engineer um, and designed all these sorts of planes and he ended up designing the plane that was used by the Japanese government, the military, for suicide bombings during the Second World War. And so there's a question as to should we be kind of glorifying this figure who had such a, even though it's, even in the film, like, I think the way this movie rationalizes it and makes it okay um, to have him as a main character. I don't know a lot about his personal history and his personal opinions on things, but the way this movie is framed is that he is an artist, he is a dreamer who, ha who wanted to always make a plane and the fact that um, sort of his pride and joy, his goal in life ultimately became a tool of death and destruction for hundreds if not thousands of people um is was never his intention and never what he wanted from from his work and even in the film it it makes uh parallels to a similar situation with an italian um engineer who designed the planes that were used in the first world war um and the idea of having your work and your passions uh, militarized and then used to actively kill other people. Like, that's a, it's, it's a hard thing to navigate and it's a hard thing to write about without making it seem like you're justifying war, you know, I, I, or glorifying war. There is a very fine line. And I do think that Miyazaki is able to walk it without, because it, without it feeling nationalistic or anything like that. I do think that this particular man didn't want he, he him making planes. He wanted to make people happy, and then unfortunately, they were used for kind of the complete opposite of that goal. So it's it's hard to say like this movie shouldn't have been made but I can understand why people might be upset the the fact that they're making a movie about a person uh, and Miyazaki especially is making a movie about a person who 
had a profound impact on the kind of the worst part of Japanese history, um, regardless of whether it was intentional or not. Do we need to be glorifying those who actively facilitated a country at war, war, even if that wasn't what they wanted to do? Because it's not so much like that a movie about him was made. I think it's the, the fact that it was an animated movie from a beloved director of children's films from a studio that is worldwide beloved and generally makes children films. Is this the right avenue for this story? It's a hard, it's a hard conversation and a hard uh, argument and situation. But ultimately, I don't think the film is. I think the film is aware of the pr problematic elements of itself and of telling the story. But I do think that it ultimately there might have been a different venue or avenue for this story that uh, Miyazaki could have gone with comparatively to making it a Ghibli film, if that makes sense. Not to, again, not to say that Ghibli is, hasn't touched on very serious and wartime topics before. Uh, Takahata's, as I said, first film with the studio was Grave of the Fireflies, which is hugely about the war, obviously. Um, it's just, it just, there's there's problems with the whole thing and it's not a bad film in fact it's a very good film but it just feels weird that it became a film if that makes sense you know i don't know next is the final of takahata's films before his untimely death and that is the tale of the princess kaguya this is a film adaptation of the folklore of Princess Kaguya. If you don't know what the story is about, it's about a young, it's about a bamboo cutter who cuts, um, does he discover a peach or does he cut a bamboo? And then, um, he is blessed, he and his wife are just blessed with a young girl who they name Kaguya or something I don't remember but she grows really super quickly and it's very obvious she's not like fully human and ultimately she's she is the princess of the moon princess Kaguya but uh, she gets sent to the capital and um, in order to be wed to the emperor and all of these different like three or four different men want to marry her or a lot of different men she gives them all impossible tasks and is kind of um kind of a, just a general bitch to all of these people and she's being called to the moon to return to her where she's actually from it's it's very like it's a fairy tale pretty much it's a straightforward fairy tale and it's beautiful. This film is phenomenal. The the hand animated quality of this film, the style, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> check it out. It is so nice. I saw this movie. I saw I've seen quite a few Ghibli films in the cinemas. I've seen Ponyo, I've seen uh Totoro, I've seen um Princess Mononoke. I've seen um, uh, Arietti and Poppy Hill and Kaguya and the final film as well. All in the cinemas. Did I say Ponyo? Because I saw that in cinemas too. Um, I've seen a solid chunk of them in cinemas. This is probably the best experience with a Ghibli film. I mean, they're all phenomenal, but this one I think had the largest impact on me and walking out of the cinema. I was just absolutely blown away and it is such a shame that Takahata did has since passed on but he had a long and happy uh, assume, presumably life um, and he did leave us with so many phenomenal works and what a film to end a career on really it's it's beautiful and 
Um, yeah, it's it's very Takahata. Like, if you enjoy his other films, then you will enjoy this one. Finally, um, sort of, finally, the last official film of Ghibli as of so far. Who knows what's going on with the studio currently. Um, and Studio Ponok is sort of the follow-up of it. We already talked about Mary and the Witch's Flower in the last video, but as of now, this is the final of Studio Ghibli's films. This is When Marnie Was There by Hiromasa uh, Yonabayashi, who is the same director as Arietti. This is the second film with the studio. And this is, this is a beautiful film. I love this movie a lot. It's very powerful. Um, I don't know how good of an adaptation it is to the, um, the novel or novella or whatever it's based off of. <laughs> I haven't read it. I don't know. Um, but I think that this film draws in a lot of issues, societal issues, um, that are very, they're not unique to Japan, but I think they're very relevant to Japan and, um, the Jap Japanese audiences are more acutely aware of that are the perceptions are um, different from a Western audience because I for this film when Western media talks about it and Western fans talk about it there's a huge narrative of um, sort of queer identity and um, lesbianism and the acceptance of that um, and so that's a huge aspect of a lot of the western discussion of this movie which is not inherently wrong I mean death of the author and all of that everyone is free to gain and interpret art however they wish and it's it is a very valid um, way to to interpret the film but I don't necessarily think that was the intention of the film you know um, the first this movie from a Japanese perspective I think appeals a lot more to the isolation of individuals in society who are from a mixed background who aren't quote-unquote pure Japanese of which our protagonist is not she she doesn't she has um, relatives who are not Japanese, so and so she isn't fully accepted by her peers and the people around her and even other members of her family, um, which is heartbreaking. And that's not an, I mean, that's not a purely Japanese issue, but it is something that is, again, more keenly felt and I think more people are more aware of in Japan than they are in the, you know, in the US and Australia and that, um, comparatively to the, the queer narrative. So there's a couple of different ways you can interpret this film. All of them are good and regardless, it's a beautiful story and it'll make you cry. There's particular scenes that are just absolutely breathtaking with this, with this movie and, uh, it's just really really wonderful um powerful story about growing up isolation acceptance and finding yourself and feeling like you're so different from everyone else which again can be applied to either of those scenarios or a multitude of other scenarios um, i think there's a lot of relatability in this movie although um, if you are purely going for the queer narrative, it doesn't, it's not going to satisfy you <laughs> on that extent because I think some people expected, expected things and then were disappointed when that wasn't what happened and then, you know, <sighs> but it is a beautiful film. I highly, highly, highly encourage you to watch it if you haven't, I mean, I, who knows if Ghibli is coming back. Miyazaki says he's going to retire and then comes back every, you know, two years. Um, <laughs> he Im immediately uh, negates 
whatever whatever he says in regards to retirement every single time. Um, so who knows? We might see another movie or two from him. But as for now, Studio Ghibli is quiet. Um, I think there may be plans for him. I, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Needless to say, they are huge... Uh, have left a huge impact on Japanese animation community, the global animation community, and their stories are timeless and will be enjoyed by so many people for so long now and in the future and in the past. It's just their legacy of work, even if there's never another Ghibli film again, cannot be ignored and all of their movies except for Ocean Waves, <laughs> are phenomenal. And even Ocean Waves is worth watching at least once. Um, yeah, just just, uh, just uh, really, really happy that I am almost complete with my, with my personal collection of there. More manga with Sunny. This is a six-volume series by Taio Matsumoto, a hardcover from Viz. Really nice release for creator who I've already talked about in this video but um, really respect his work we have a solid chunk of it um, from Viz already we are getting ping pong next year which is super duper exciting uh, really respect his work and really really happy that we have gotten so much of it in English if you're not familiar with this particular title this is a story about a orphanage in Japan during the 70s and the various you know kids who live in this I say orphanage it's sort of a group home not all of these kids have lost their parents a lot of them have kind of been left there under the care of the um, organizers of the people who run it as they try as their parents kind of try to find a better life for themselves or they realize they can't support themselves with a child or they just kind of don't want a kid around anymore uh so a lot of these kids are abandoned by people who don't really deserve to be parents um it's it's written with a lot of matsumoto's kind of uh abrupt and cynical humor but none of these all of these characters feel like um they feel like kids you know they're they get up to some naughty stuff <laughs> um they're kind of brats then they are problem children they're not in a great situation and they cause trouble for each other and for um you know the adults in their lives and the, they are really not treated well by the townspeople either. There are a lot of the kids they go to school with bully them and make fun of them because, you know, they're, they're the unwanted kids and they live in an orphanage and therefore they're, you know, they smell and they have old clothes and all that crap that kids are really mean about. And so it's about the daily lives of these various kids. And these are like young kids babies all the way to late teens um, so the older kids kind of look after the younger kids as well and it's just it's a really 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 good story like with all of Matsumoto's works there his characters feel like especially kids because he writes a lot of kids and they feel like kids they're not um because kids can be little shits, you know. They <laughs> kids aren't inherently innocent. They're not inherently well behaved. They're not inherently um, necessarily um, hero material, if that makes sense. And the same can be said for Sunny. All of these kids, they have their issues, which makes them not always make good decisions. But they're ultimately good kids. They are trying their best. They do care about the people in their lives and most notably they all just want acceptance and that's a large part of the series is the search for acceptance whether it be from the parent that, that abandons them whether that be from their peers whether that be uh, like classmate peers whether that be from the other kids at the orphanage 
it's it's really good I love it <laughs> a whole lot and I don't know if it's still like I think it's kind of some of the volumes aren't necessarily out of print but they are pricey for one but um, I think they are kind of getting a little bit harder to find so I would encourage you to pick them up sooner rather than later if this is a title that sounds interesting to you um, at six volumes it's not super duper long but they are as I said they are pretty pricey just because of being hardback and they're kind of an older phase release I want to say they're not old but they're not like really that new I feel like I've I've known about these releases forever, but who knows? That might be a total misnomer and me not remembering. I'm going to be checking the publication date on volume six because that's the last one. And it says 2011. So, mm, no, when was the printing? 2016. So it wasn't that long ago. It just feels like forever ago. 2016 was... A while ago <laughs> um, but yeah so it's not like it's an old release per se but I feel like it's not a high priority release for a lot of people and thus it's not a, a title that Viz might want to keep actively in print or at least um, there's not a huge clamor for this to stay in print if that makes sense I don't know I might not be making any sense who knows that's that's how it fe that's how it is after I've filmed nine hours worth of this content. The only other thing on this shelf is Day of the Flying Head by Shintaro Kago. This is a self-published work or doujinshi by Kago, who I already spoke about in the last video, um, who's the author of Dementia 21 and other various things, but this is kind of very quintessential cargo work. Um, you can see the cute girl, but then just like the visceral organs, grossness. Uh, and this is about a girl. Well, actually, it's sort of a string of short stories. It's, there's four doujin in all for the whole series. And they are self-published. And they are, there's no need for translation because there's no dialogue for the whole series. Again, like with the other industrial uh, world war or whatever that is. I can't remember. Industrial Revolution and World War, I think, is what that book was called. Who knows? I don't remember. That was a while ago. Um, <clears throat> this is about, uh, I guess, a disease or an affliction where uh, people... It's like a weird society, I guess, um, or weird affliction, disease, that makes people, animals, living beings, uh, literally lose their heads and it pulls all their organs out. And they can float and fly around and terrorize other people after leaving their bodies behind. And uh, it's very, I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's based off of a particular monster and folklore throughout Southeast Asia. Um, that is pretty much this. It's the floating head and organs of a woman and goes around and terrorizes people. Usually like, um, I want to say the Philippines and Malaysia, that kind of area. This is pretty well-known folklore. Interesting choice, but definitely within Kaga's kind of typical typical interests and this is a this was actually released by um is it holo press or um yeah holo press where a lot of his works are printed um but again because they're they are um dialogueless a la like this you don't need a translation, so you can, you'd buy it just directly from him, from what I understand. And also, these are technically limited editions. There's only 600 copies of each, but I think it's still readily available. I don't remember. Because I actually bought these secondhand.
Um, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you can get them easily. And if you want more Kago in your life, um, you, you want more of his crazy twisted um, art style and Eroguro work, then this is a great one to have. Hey look, although the shelf is empty, it is not usually empty. We have reached more CDs. <laughs> you thought we were done. We were not. Uh, first off is this actually is, um, you can see it's like DTA mascot and visual story CD. This is basically for your computer to put um, animated little mascots of the free characters on your desktop just to hang around and like talk and, and, and do things whilst you're on your computer. This, um, I didn't buy it for this, but this came as an additional bit for one of the illustrated art books um, for free, which you will see later in the collection video. Not in this video, but you will see it later in the overall collection video. And yeah, kind of an interesting one. Not um, not something I use, but it's just kind of a cu curiosity. Continuing with free though, we have Ray John by Old Codex. I was correct, Old Codex is the band that I was thinking of. This is basically the opening song for the first season. I mean, I don't know what else you need, aside from that's what it is. It's a good song. Free has pretty kick-ass openings. Even people who don't like it are like, dang though, it has great openings. Then we have Dried Up Youthful Fame, which is the opening for season two, um, which is kind of a, I mean, Dried Up Youthful Fame is kind of a theme of the second season, so it makes sense. We've got our boys, as per expected. And these are all singles as well, by the way. And then we have Aching Horns, which is the single for the film for um, the high speed free starting days film, which is the kids in middle school. Then, oh boy, then we have Style 5 music, which is the ending songs for free. I do not have the opening, like the single and the endings for the most current season or some of the movies, just because I don't have the money for this kind of stuff that much anymore. Um, and this is Slash Free, which is, oh my god, the catchiest ending song ever. I um, So Style 5 is the five say the five main say just singing as a boy band group. <laughs> as, like, if again, if you watch anime, this is fairly typical. You get all of the, the voice actors, get them to sing the ending as a, as a musical group, and the, 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 that's the song. And so they're, the five of these characters are together, are called Style Five. Splash free, bloom, bloom, bloom. It's a good song, um, especially for like a say group song. And then, as if Splash Free wasn't like pretty boppin' as it is, um, then we have Future Fish, which is the end of the season two. It's the season two ending. And which is that mm, catchy as all get out. Um, honestly, like the endings for this show should not be nearly as catchy as they are. Also, you may have noticed this one has an Arabian Nights theme, which is what the ending Arabian Nights theme. This one has the like childhood dreams, what I want to be when I grow up theme. And Haru, of course, chose a freaking mermaid. Um, and which is very relevant, more so the relevant than this one. But, okay, the genius of KyoAni, because they're like, no, we can merchandise this. We cannot, we've already sold like 13 million rubber straps with the Arabian Nights theme and all of this. Then, in season three, season three? In, no, it was in the OVA branching season two and season three um the take your marks film they reveal that this ending or at least the idea of this ending is a movie 
that the swim club makes to try and get kids to join the swim club. And it freaking works for one. Like, it's just... Because in the third season, obviously, Masha and Hara and Rin and Sosuke have graduated. They go to university now because that's how life works. You get older, you move to, into different stages of your life. But Nagisa and Rai ha- are trying to keep the swim club going and, and go as well. Are trying to keep the swim club going and in order to reel in new prospective members. They make an Arabian Nights themed movie where it like I don't it looked like a fun time. They went out to the sand dunes of Totori because again, if you don't know, the series is set in Totori, which is the least populous um prefecture of Japan. And it's famous for its sand dunes. Um imagine living in a place that was famous for its sand dunes that isn't like in a desert necessarily. That's just kind of weird. Anyway, they go to the sand dunes. I was like, hey, tourism. Um, (laughs) And they film this movie. And they hire a camel. And in the third season, legitimately one of the kids that joins the swim club does it because their movie was so good and he wants to meet the camel. Like that, I'm not even joking. That's the thing. And I was like, that kid keep living your best life. That's amazing. Also, I can't believe this this harebrained scheme worked. Um, anyway, this this ending is very much like, oh, these the what what would you um what's your dream to grow up in? You know, you ask kids. And it's pretty fun. You got like scientist Ray and astronaut Nagisa, fireman, Makoto and police officer Rin and Sosuke. And then just just mermaid Haru, which is very in character. I was like, of course. They, there's also Chef Haru, but it's mainly mermaid Haru. Um, and that was a good time. <laughs> and then in the third one, it's like, I think that because there's so many boys, there's so many characters, not just boys, but mainly boys, they, they kind of just do like an idol unit type of stage production thing which is not as interesting and creative so I'm like oh that's okay I guess next is another complete best which is Kuroshitsuji or Black Butler this has all the openings and endings for the three seasons of Black Butler and maybe the movie I don't remember there's a lot of I I like, I actually really like the first season of the Black Butler anime. I've said this before, but it's not really, um, it does its own thing and it's an anime original ending, but I think it works really well. Season two, I think, is unanimously hated across the board by everyone. And this, it's the quintessential example when talking about Mari Okada's work sometimes being just a, a trash fire and like what the who did, who thought this was a good idea um I actually like certain elements of the second season of Black Butler but I'm not gonna say it's good I think it was had a lot of potential to be good and then threw it all away in the last episode um those who know you know uh season three was a direct manga adaptation which obviously pleased a lot of people and uh, I don't know if the film stuff is in here because I think this came out before the film. But we got Chiel and we got Sebastian. And this one is a, yeah. Oh my god, it's a got an Undertaker pin. And postcard. Oh my god, oh my god. The things you discover when you open stuff you've had for years and kind of just never look at or touch. I would say that this is, yeah, this is the music and this is the actual openings and endings. So it's probably just the three seasons, but who knows? Who knows? Actually, I could tell you, that might be a good idea. Um, We've got first opening, we've got the I'm Alive ending, Lacrimosa ending, 
Season 2, Season 2. Yeah, okay, so it includes... Yeah, it includes the three seasons stuff. And nothing to do with the movie or the OVAs. Which is what I expected. Because this came out before the movie and the OVAs came out. Um, Black Butler's a fun time. It's not like a perfect series or anything. But I enjoy it. And that's all you really need for for this series. And I would say like the manga is better than the anime. The anime first season is solid. The third season is solid. The movie and all that is solid. The second season, tread with caution. <laughs> I The second season has nothing to do with Black Butler. It's like the weirdest fan fiction spin-off of Black Butler. Our main characters are there, but like I don't know why they made it a Black Butler. Like, I don't know why they could have made it a Black Butler kind of spin-off without having the main main characters within it. I just I I just feel like there was potential there and they squandered it. It just yeah, it is a it's a weird time. Kind of parallels something that the manga is going through currently right now though. Next is um this is the single for uh, the Anohana film. This is a circle game. I think this has the... I like Galileo Galilei a lot. The, this particular band musician. And although Anohana isn't my favourite thing of all time. Um, I appreciate what it's done. Again, Mari Okara. <laughs> but this one is a bit more effective than Black Butler Season 2. I'd say way more effective. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just a single, and it has, I think, the, you can see it has a DVD with it as well. Um, yeah, it would have been opening and ending or something along those lines. Openings, openings and, um, the movie version of the movie single. Next! Oh my god, this was upside down. Uh, this is a weird one because, like, the disc is case is weird. This is Mushishi, one of the soundtracks for it. I I hope to hunt down all of the Mushishi music because if you have not seen Mushishi, the music is an incredible and important part of the experience. It is beautiful, terrifying, eerie. This overall wonderful. Just everything is wonderful about it. And I think this is technically a collection of songs from the second season. But there's like a lot of different releases for Mushishi music. And I'm not quite sure like what is included with everything. And also like the soundtracks don't have... Um, you can see like these are just soundtrack music. There's not openings and endings stuff. Because the opening, for one, for the ending is always different. It's just like an instrumental piece for Mushishi for each episode. The opening is always like a, a song, a single of an English speaking artist that is being released in Japan. Uh, the Sore Feet song is the first seasons, which is beautiful. And then the second seasons is Shiver by Lucy Rose, which is also beautiful. Uh, oh, good music, but also good music. And I'm really happy to have it in the collection. I, and again, trying to hunt down more Mushishi. Next, you thought we were done with Full Alchemist. We will never be done with Full Alchemist. We have uh, soundtrack one for 2003. We have soundtrack two. For 2003 and then we have three for 2003 so this is all the original music for the original anime adaptation that harmonica piece though there's a lot of harmonica usage <laughs> in full Alchemist 2003 there are some soundtracks in the, there are some particular music tracks that are so iconic that like, we immediately know, oh, 
Full Metal Alchemist. Even years and years and years out having watched it, it's just like you know that that one sad harmonica tune is coming and you're going to go, oh no, the war, the war on Ishval, oh no. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, of course, wouldn't be Full Metal Alchemist collection without soundtrack one for Brotherhood, which is, okay, these, these soundtrack covers, like, tell a story. So we've got Edward just kind of, like, moping around in a very lush, um, lush room. He's got a, uh, the composer stick wand, whatever it's called. Um, and then we've got soundtrack two, where he's actually composing and, like, practicing the music, right? And then soundtrack three, where he's perform, he's, co he's conducting the performers in the orchestra for the music. So it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> I thought that was just a cool little thing that they did. I like it when they get a little bit creative with the soundtracks and artwork for music for the franchise. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, really great soundtrack. Lots of really iconic themes and pieces of music. Just overall, a really great, great time. Before we get started on this shelf, you can see there is a tiny little gate. What is this, you may ask? This is... Um, actually some of the first kind of like Full Malcolmers merchandise I have it is a notebook that looks like the Gate of Truth and when you open it, oh my god! And then you've got a little bookmark which is a very iconic scene of the Brotherhood and then inside, ooh, this would have, I'm pretty sure this was a prize for like Ichiban Kuji. I don't know. I bought it years ago and have never used it aside from in display. I'm going to put it back later because it's going to slip. Otherwise, we have just a couple more music things. Uh, first is Yoshiyuki Sadamoto Working Music CD. This is a collection of music that was written for the Evangelion manga. So it open. it's got a booklet. Oh my god. Here. Evangelion, you know, I mean, I don't, that's not necessarily obvious Evangelion. There's some obvious Evangelion. Um, yeah, I mean, what else do I need to say? It's Evangelion. It's a pretty, it's a pretty nice collection of just like instrumental pieces and it's in a slipcase like so. And I think this came with the limited edition of volume 14 of the manga. So, yeah, that's a cool extra. Next is another complete best, uh, or music best in this case. And this is for another show that I feel like nobody's watched, a la Skit Dance. This is Shirakuma Cafe. I'm going to have to put it this way because it doesn't fit right side up. This is a really cute uh, longer show. I think it's 50, 70, 90 episodes, something like that. Um, about a polar bear who runs a cafe a la Shirakuma Cafe or Polar Bear Cafe um, and his various customers most notably a young panda and a grumpy cynical penguin and it's it's a slice of life just easy watching and it, like they live in a society where animals just kind of like are part of life. Hum I mean, they're part of life now, but they're like part of society and have human intelligence and interactions and have, uh, you know, jobs and that. It's just really, really wonderful. And also like humans interact with these animals as well. Like it's not a weird thing. Uh, but Panda, you know, obviously Polar Bear has his cafe. I don't know what Penguin does. I feel like he might be a teacher or something. I don't know. He's kind of a... He's always looking for love and he gets, you know, rejected all of the time. And then we also have Panda who actually works at the zoo as a panda. Who would have thunk it? Uh, you can see here, um, like, there's other... 
characters. You have Mama Panda. You have some of the human characters as well. So we have the human waitress. I don't remember her name. Oh my god, if it wants to open. Uh, and that's her. And then the panda's little sister, Llama and um, Sloth, who are regular customers. We have Honda-san, who is, again, like, he kind of works at, as a gardener, I think, or like a grounds person. You know, he has a big, huge crush on the waitress uh, woman uh, here. And then we have, this guy is a florist who is, like, in love with Panda. He's super into it. You got, uh, is that, I don't know if that's Dad Panda or if that's, like, panda's co-worker who's also a panda who works at the zoo as a panda and then we've got grizzly who is uh polar bear's best friend but yeah really fun funny series really low-key i highly highly recommend to everyone go watch it it's on crunchyroll and it deserves your love these and these okay because the thing about this particular show as well um is this is all of the music, the endings. It's got um, three, two or three, like, just general op openings. And then all of the endings are voiced or sung by various voice actors. And there's, like, quite a few famous ones. And all of these are characters who sing the songs. That's why they're included on this CD, um, obviously. Llama's song is the best song. Fight me. <laughs> it's very goofy. I love it. And then finally, finally, we have another theme song collection. This is openings, endings, and then also just some like additional music, I believe. And this is for when they cry. Uh, so the com both seasons and the OVA, I believe, or Higurashi no Nako Koroni a horror mystery series that I talked about in the last video because I have the anime Blu-rays of and it's, I mean, it's great. It has the opening, especially the first opening is really like, it sets the tone for it really well uh, and I can still hear the openings of that song, like just the first couple bars of the original opening and it's, it just like gives me shivers gives me shivers um yeah i mean like this whole whole thing it's just it's music i enjoy i'm happy to have it for shows that i enjoy and for shows that i don't think people necessarily um remember or notice especially like shark in cafe and when they cry and that they're uh people don't remember their shows for the music in them but i remember them and i also remember the music in them <laughs> So it's just nice. I A lot of the times I'll put this in a car and just like listen to it for a week or so and then switch it out with something else. So that's how I live my life. You know, it, it's fine. Also, before I forget, I also have in front of the gate, because I, I had to pull her out for this, I have uh, Xiaomei, who is the panda from the tiny panda from Full Alchemist, um, who, who hangs out with uh, the little girl from Xing. It's her, like, buddy mascot. And that, again, was a Ichiban Kuji prize. And that's probably a, a one-for-one -one scale figure plush of her. She's very cute. Very cute panda. On the top of the next shelf, this is the only manga that I'm going to be showing off, but this is Neon Genesis Evangelion, the omnibus releases of the manga, I guess, version of this series. Um, like with a couple of the franchises I've talked about already today, I actually really like how every iteration of Neon Genesis Evangelion kind of does its own thing. Not everything is exactly the same. They bring different elements to the table. And it's certainly one that I think people will like if you need things explained to you. You want it more straightforward than the ending. 
who the anime uh, provides us. Also, you see uh, the first of my figures in this cabinet because this whole this whole bookcase is figures pretty much. Uh, just fair warning of Shinji and Kaoru, main male characters of this the the um, show and also the movie. Obviously, well, I don't know if Kaoru is a main character, but he certainly has an impact on the series. Um, these two are price figures. They were actually released in conjunction with the third film, um, You Cannot Redo. Uh, and these two are kind of the main characters of that film. A very divisive film, one that I think a lot of people dislike, but I do not. I really like it, and I think for the rebuild films, it's the one that really pulls in a lot of the mental... Uh, and emotional stuff that was so important for the original shows. Um, I felt like Redo captured a lot of the despair and desper well, yeah, despair and desperation um, of the longer and older show and a lot of the themes that Arno was playing from and his experiences it's really I mean <laughs> it's heartbreaking and it's uh kind of well known about what happens in that third film now but uh the tragedy of these two characters and their relationship oh 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 uh, but yeah, um, I really like these particular figures. I don't own any other Evangelion figures. At least, yeah, no, I don't own any other Evangelion figures. Just think about that for a second. Um, mainly because I don't really care enough about it to own a huge amount. Plus these two, okay, you will see, you will see in the next part of this video that pair figures, and you'll see it in like later, later collection, uh, parts, but you'll see in this this video. I am a sucker for paired figures figures that are meant to be posed together whether that's um, because I Love that they're in love <laughs> Or I want them to be in love generally. That's I mean, that's really the only reason but I Really really like when two characters who are important to each other have figures that kind of are meant to be posed together. I just think it's cool. I just think it's kind of neat. Um, and these two are cheap price figures, or at least they were cheap at the time. I'm not sure if they're super cheap now. Um, well made, really well made for the fact that they are price figures. And uh, really glad that I got this set, I think they bookend the manga very, very well. And yeah, I think if you don't have a huge amount of money for figures, price figures are a good option. They don't really disappoint, in my opinion. I think you can get a lot of really well-made, um, well-made stuff for not a huge price. top shelf of this bookcase we have these three uh first being Utena from Revolutionary Girl Utena which was the first thing I talked about in this um in this video this actually kind of was meant to be a pair figure but her anthe was never made which is a super duper shame I really like this particular Utena figure it's by far the best that we've gotten I think in so far as detailing and paint wise and sculpt and all of that really really happy to have her she is beautiful and uh, I love her just overall look and how well I think Kotobukiya did on her I can't remember who made her uh, uh, the next is Maka from Soul Eater again very dynamic pose and this is another character who doesn't really have any other figures this is from a very um small figure company and i don't think they exist anymore 
actually, which is a shame because they did a good job on Marka. Um, yeah, I she takes up a lot of space what, with the scythe and her large base and her coat being all dynamic and in movement, but I really like it. And this is one of the first figures that I ever bought. Not the first, but one of the first. And I was glad that I got it at the time I did because I don't think I'd be able to find her now um, if I was hunting for her, which is kind of a shame because Soul Eater, again, for as popular as it is, it doesn't actually have a huge amount of merchandise or figures or anything like that. And finally is Kino, the protagonist from Kino's Journey. This is the original figure. It did get a re-release later on. This is a Good Smile uh, release. They 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 did a good job. Um, I, you saw an earlier, uh, another Kino figure that I have in the collection. And I've said it before, I'll say it a hundred million times. I don't, when it comes to figures, I don't really buy a lot of the figures of the same character compared to some people who have just like a shrine dedicated to their favorite character, which is cool. More power to you, not really my thing, but there are exceptions. <laughs> I always have exceptions. And Kino is one of them. Um, Natsume is one of them. Uh, Yuri and Ice characters are, is one of them. And Free Boys is another one. So I have a, quite a few exceptions. <laughs> but I actually don't buy that many figures anymore or kind of in general. I do have some on pre-order because they're making more characters that I care about and not just like generic uh, Saber uh, 375 from the most recent Fate iteration. Um, but really happy that this figure got a re-release as well thanks to the newer anime. It's a good, it's a really solid sculpt but pretty like kind of in the more typical uh, just standing pose although with their gun. So this is kind of like my action shelf because all of them are about to fight someone. We got the scythe, we got the sword, and we got the gun. So we got, uh, they're, they're prepared for whatever it is they're fighting. So that's why I grouped these three together. So I've already exposed myself as a Mako Haru fan in <laughs> this video. But this, honestly, even if I wasn't, even if I wasn't, I, this figure is so beautiful, is so beautiful. Remember what I said about pair figures? This is honestly like the epitome of pair figures for me. This, these two you actually buy as like the single unit. Sometimes with pair figures, you have to buy them separately. These two you buy together and it is, reenacting an iconic scene from the free starting days slash high speed film uh, when these characters are in middle school um, which is kind of the emotional uh, high point and um, catalyst for that film watch that movie and I don't know if you're not convinced that at least my boy Makoto is in love with his best friend that I don't know what else is would convince you let's be real uh, but yeah beautiful scene beautiful film and the altar made this you might not be able to see it I'm, I'm gonna zoom in um, here at the feet in the water you can see from the splash okay there's in Makoto's one, there's a killer whale, which is like his animal. Again, for people who don't who don't watch the show, that's like his theme animal. And then in Haru's is the dolphin, which is his animal. And oh my god, it's just like so such nice attention to detail. It's just so beautiful. I love these boys a lot. And Alter is one of the best companies when it comes to figures it just at all in general full stop i also have you can see there's two prize figures for young makoto and haru this is when they were in baby 
primary school, I want to say probably the second or third grade. Um, so again, I love childhood friends and they, these two are always, always drawn together. Always look at, I mean, these figures are made, they're looking at each other. They are made to be like looking. <sighs> the thing is, you can't have one without the other. And that might just be because otherwise Haru would literally never know how to use his phone because he relies on his best friend to do shit for him continuously throughout the entire franchise. Even as a university student, they rely on each other a lot. <laughs> um, just, yeah. Oh, it's such a beautiful release. And again, this particular one is very dynamic. I like the movement, the water, and just the choice of the scene and just how the alter captured it in a three-dimensional form. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And yeah, I'm gonna stop fangirling and just go to the next one. Next is pretty much the majority of my Nendroids. I don't own a huge amount, but I do own the Haikyuu ones because I love Haikyuu. I love all the boys. And really this series doesn't have any any uh, scale figures for it. And also, like, they have price figures and stuff, which you will see also later. Um, but with, with sports series in particular, it, especially team sports series like Haiki, there are so many characters and realistically you're not going to get scale figures of every single character because there's just so many there's too many boys so many boys they're they're not going to make one eighth scales or one seventh or what even one tenth scales of all of these boys they'll make maybe figma they'll make nendroids like these ones or prize figures and haikyuu has been very successful with their nendroids and they're so cute look how cute they are guys look how cute so this is Karasuno or the main character team core team of Karasuno there are also some second year characters who have not gotten nendroids but are um maybe with the fourth season we might see in Oshita um otherwise I don't know about the other the other one or two um because they're a little bit of a non-presence within the series as a whole but here we have the main team of Haikyuu we have Suki we have Yamaguchi in the back here we have in the middle Noya in the back corner we have Suga my my favorite my boy I love him and Daichi um, who are the captain and vice captain of the team, just by the way. We have our main characters in the front here. We have Hinata, who is the main character and sort of his rival slash friend slash whatever, um, Kageyama. Together, they are the unstoppable duo. And then, of course, of course, we have Tanaka and um, Asahi. So we have the main characters all of these characters um aside from maybe i mean i would say that suga and yamaguchi are the two that sit out of games for the most part the other seven are kind of the ones who play but those two are kind of the pinch hitters they come in when they're needed and usually support the team the best way they can yeah, I love them. They're also really sweet. And I try to pose them in ways that they kind of, they, they just are. That's how their their personalities. Um, yeah, I think this was the best option for me with this series because, as I said, it's not a, it's not a series that gets a lot of um, scale figures. And also, it just... It would be such an investment because honestly, like, I love all of these boys. I love all of these boys pretty much um, the exact same amount. And I couldn't just, like, choose one boy 
to be like, yes, this is my boy. I mean, I could, it would be Suga, but like, if it wasn't, if it wasn't Sugawara, um, I, I, I just need them all. I just need them all. It's bad enough that the whole freaking manga, like every character, even the rival team characters, they're all so good. I just want them all. I love them all. I want to support them all. And I hope they all achieve their dreams. Okay? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, what more to say? Haikyuu is phenomenal. And Karasuno are great. I love them. I decided to turn the lights on for this one because they, I, they deserve it. Okay? So pair figures yet again this finally I was just recently able to complete the these two this pair for those not in the know this is Yuri Katsuki and Victor Nikiforov from Yuri on Ice the main characters who are in love and engaged to be married just by the way they are proof that love exists right so um, these two are from Toy Works they're one-eighth scales and a lot of people dislike these scales and in particular they dislike Victor who is released first um, he's not like the most perfect scale but I honestly don't have an issue with him people are like oh his hair looks bad he's, he's just he looks ugly I'm like not really and in comparison to the other Victor scales that we've gotten because we have gotten a couple different Victor scales we've also gotten one other Yuri scale and one Yurio scale or Yuri Plisetsky scale um, and there's like a bunch of different androids as well for characters um, this one I like the most because the other one he's in a skating pose but just in like a white shirt and black pants which is from the opening which is just kind of like boring and then the other one is his coach self sitting on a bench it just I'm like okay I mean it's in character but like I don't know I like elite skater Victor I mean I love just Victor anyway but when you have these two together they make a heart look it's a heart you put it's they're reaching for each other and their body they make a heart guys love exists right Toy Works did a really good job and and I will fight anyone who doesn't think that their Yuri is probably the nicest looking Yuri out of all of the Yuris that we've gotten. He looks really good and Victor doesn't look bad. Like I think he he probably looks nicer in real life versus photographs and again I'm not as picky as some collectors who like hyper analyze every sh strand of hair and that's, I mean, it's good to be vigilant and critical in this, in figure collecting because it's an expensive hobby. But Victor in particular, like totally bargain binned. I got him for like 30 bucks. Um, I will say that he wasn't really worth like the, his quality quote unquote is, isn't something that I'd be spending 90 bucks or 120 bucks on. So I can understand people being critical of it, but Yuri, Yuri went, disappeared the day he was released. Every, every version, every, every one of, every single box was sold and he became rarer than friggin leprechaun teeth. Like it's, he, it is impossible to find Yuri at all. I found him because I found a broken ver like a broken uh, one and he was being sold on Yahoo Japan for for sales price like for what he was sold as when he was new when he was released so I paid the amount that people were paying for him and luckily for me the break was one of these crystals back here it was just super easy just glue and good as new so not a big issue for me oh my god I'm so happy to have them together because as I said 
they invented love, they proved that love is real, and that they make a heart when posed together. They are reaching for each other. And if you haven't watched this show, um, I mean, we can't be friends. <laughs> also in this particular shelf, we have three acrylic stands of um, a particular artist who I follow. Um, and she is incredible, but she has three stands. The first one being here, that's their drunken dance off first night when they meet, basically. This one is their, the finale of the first season, the pair skate that they do together, spoilers. And then the middle one is a speculative acrylic stand of their wedding because as I said they are engaged to be wed and they're you know that's that's how engagements usually end is in weddings um yeah really love these characters really love these figures of these characters I don't own any other figures of Yuri and Ice currently except for my boy Pitch it, Nandroid. You guys see him every single video because he's in the background of all my pickup videos. <laughs> um, and I do have the Good Smile scales on order, but those don't come in until um, June or July next year. And they're like very different. These are in their skating outfits, which I really like as well. Those particular skating outfits. I love the Euro Nice outfit uh, for Yuri. And Victor's you know, Stay Close to Me outfit, which uh, speaks for itself. Um, but yeah, it's um, uh, the, the new Good Smile scale is very nice. I would say that like certain aspects of the sculpt for these ones I like more than the Good Smile ones. And Good Smile is like one of the best sculptor like companies out there. Uh, but that one's more of a casual kind of running on the beach with their dog um, domestic figure, which I'm looking forward to. Again, pair figure, love it, need more of that shit in my life. And I look forward to it. But right now I have this shrine to love, um, <laughs> pride of center place in my collection for these figures and I really love them and I hope that we see the movie soon because it's been three years since Hero and Ice was a thing airing and it's been a long drought since then. I, I really want to see more Yuri and Ice content. content. We were promised and I, I have every faith in MAPPA. I really, really do. And I look forward to Ice Adolescence whenever it comes out, please. The return of my swim boys. Whilst I do have Haru and Makoto and their middle school versions, and that's a beautiful altar one seventh scale. These are the one eighth altar scales of these characters in their high school versions. We have, of course, Haru and Ren in the center here. We have Sosuke and Makoto in the back corners. And then in the front we have Rei and Nagisa. Uh, for a long time we only had Ren, Haru and Makoto. Sosuke came out a little bit later after those three. And then it took a while, an additional while, for us to get Rei um, and Nagisa. Really happy that we finally were able to complete the set of the main boys, at least. Um, I'm sure there are people holding out hope for, I don't know, Momo and Nitori and um, who else? Asahi, Ikuya, etc. But, I mean, these are the main players of the series. And as much as I love those boys, as much as I love them, these are the characters that people really care about, and they are the main characters versus those guys. Um, but yeah, beautiful, beautiful job. Alter always does a good job. Although I will say that, although these are all a consistent 
one eight oh because these are all one eighth and because of the I think time difference between between releases for these figures that they're all kind of a little bit out of scale um, with each other. Because you can see like Mokta and Har and Rin, they're in scale with each other because they came out within months of each other, right? Or like within the year of each other. Sosuke is a big boy. Like look how broad he is. And I mean, he's a big boy in the show, but I wouldn't say he's that much broader than Makoto. And you look at like his shoulder width, and sure, it's like kind of curled in a little bit because he's got his arm crossed. But I'm like, oh boy, you got wide shoulders, boy. Like wide shoulders. Um, and then also like Nagisa's head, just because also I think the hair helps. Looks very poofy in comparison to the other boys' hair it's, and head. It's just like a little bit off. But regardless, I love all of my boys. And I think... Um, it, I kind of struggle to pose them all together, but I did want to pose them all together and I think this is probably the best setup for them. I don't know why Nagisa is just hanging out, being enthusiastic with Rune and Sosuke. I mean, he's enthusiastic everywhere, so he probably would be in that position if this was a group photo. Um, but, you know, I, I like Nagisa's, um, cause again, okay, this is a good example of the I'm standing and I'm kind of doing a pose uh, but I'm just like a, a teenage boy standing I'm a male character standing as a figure um, where Nagisa has some uh, yeah he has some dynamic movement in his pose Rin also is like serving looks look at that over the shoulder like look uh, he knows he knows he's a cool guy um, they all have that, like, oh, we're, the wind is blowing, um, which is very reminiscent of the openings and endings, and kind of just sports series in general. Uh, so it's very on brand for this, this series, and I think that the, the sculptors and, um, yeah, they, they did a good job with it. Although I would say that it, because of the weight, they're, like, slight inconsistency. I'd say that like Nagisa is more in scale with Sosuke and then the other four are like more in scale with each other. I don't know if that was the difference between sculptor or what but it's something that I think you only have to be kind of um it's not something like I I belabor over throughout the day like oh my god they ruined it. Um, it's just kind of a fact of the matter, and that's what, that's what happened. More good boys, more team of boys with, um, the Yu Hakusho main characters. We have Yusuke Urameshi right in the middle in green as per expected, and he has poo on his head. It's magnetized, so they just stick there. We're in the front, we have Kurama and as well as Hiei, who are kind of his more demonic friends within the series. Behind Kurama, we have Yoko Kurama, which is his like demon form, evil fox version um, of himself that he unleashes to kind of gain his full power. Kurama has his rose whip, as you can see, and then um, Hiei has the black dragon thing that he does. I can't remember what that's called. And then, of course, last but certainly not least, we have Kuwabara with his uh, uh, energy sword or whatever. Oh, uh, what a good team of boys. Um, yeah, I mean, these these characters are great. They're classics. It's really nice that Madhouse um, or Mega House? Mega House. Madhouse uh, is an animation studio. Mega House is a figure company. They made these five characters, four technically, 4.5 characters. Um, they did a really good job. We have been seeing more Yu Yu Hakusho figures recently just because of the 25th year anniversary, I think it is, um, which is exciting. But most of those figures tend to be Hiei and Kurama. Understandably, because they are by far the fan favorite uh, characters for the series, but really, 
it's not Yu Yu Hakusho without all of the boys. All of the boys. And um, these, we kind of lucked out because we, uh, these are technically my sister's figures. She, it's her, well, I gifted a lot of them to her, but um, she was the one who wanted to collect them, which she did. And we had all of them, except for Yusuke, for a long time. And we didn't, um, there wasn't really a re-release. I don't think we had Yusuke or um, uh, Kuwabara. We had Hiei and Kurama and Yoko Kurama. Not because we didn't want the other ones or she didn't want the other ones, but they were sold out by the time she got around to it. But we found, amazingly, we, when we were in Japan back in 2015, she found Yusuke in a store for like way cheap because the box was beaten up and she got him for like half of his normal price. And then I think Kobara got a re-release like a couple months later. So she was able to complete the set. And yeah, so really happy, really, really happy to have these boys in the collection. And they're just a really great team of Togashi characters. I love them. And she, my sister loves them, which is why she bought them. For the final shelf in this cabinet, in this bookshelf, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. Uh, up the top we have... Um, Bokuto and Akashi from Haiki, who are from a rival um, volleyball team, obviously. We also have Sword Boy 1. I don't know his name, something about Fireflies. I like him, I like his design. I know nothing about the Sword Boys, uh, Token Ranbu, for people who don't have any idea about what Sword Boys refers to. They are the anthropomorphication, the humanization of. Swords, famous swords throughout Japanese history, basically. And I like him, he's got a cute design, and I like this other sword boy. He's got stockings on. Look at him. He's he's so fancy. As you can see on the back we have another uh illustrated portrait of myself and my sister, which we got from an artist alley years and years and years ago. Again, all all of these art like portraits are always from conventions and always from a long time ago and then uh, going a little bit lower down we have the Rin and Sosuke from the same uh, childhood free toy prize figures um, who are very sweet and I have just down the front here and then we have also the Alba Josai boys from Haiki, so um, Oikawa and um, oh my god, what's his name? His name uh, Iwa Iwa Chan. I don't remember his full name. Um, Iwa Chan, are you my mom? It's like oh god, it's like, I will freaking punch you in the throat. How dare you? Um, but Oikawa and his best friend Iwa. We also. In the middle have the Nekama boys. Uh, well, not all of them, but the ones that I care the most about, which is Kenma. Uh, Hinata's, like, probably one of his closest friends who doesn't go to his school. And, uh, oh my god, I almost said Kenma again. Kuro, who's the captain of Nekama. Oh my goodness. Okay, currently in the manga of the books that are coming out, Nekama is important. And it's really fulfilling to see that in the manga currently. And I am up to date with the manga, so I've read past it on the, the, the Shonen Jump app. But um, yeah, the if you're following it via the volumes, Nekama is important right now. And I'd, again, all three of these, like these two, these two, these two up here, they're, they're like not really the main characters, they're even rival school characters, but they're so, they're written so well, you want them to do well, they're so good, these boys are so good, and you don't care that they're not the main characters, that you're meant to be rooting for, um, oh my god, oh my god. Kurasano. Why did that leave my brain for a solid, like, minute? Um, 
yeah, high key, really well done characters. So when you're reading about them, you want them all to win. But that's not how sports works. That's not how sport. I've been informed that that's not how sports works. So there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. And I'm just going to cry about it. <laughs> no, I, I really love all of these characters. There's also um, Ushu, Ushiwara, Ushiwaka, whatever his name is. Um, and the other guy from that school. They're the the kind of main uh, antagonist or main rival school in the third season of the anime. For those who only watch the anime. I can't remember his name. Japan. Japan. The Japan character. Um, they also have Nandroids, but I'm not as invested in them. Or at the time, I wasn't as invested in those two as I was the rest. I think also Lev has a Nendo, and I want to say Yaku, who are both um, uh, uh, Nekama characters, just by the way. Just throwing out names there for anyone who doesn't watch or read the series and doesn't or does and doesn't know the names and they're like, who the hell are you talking about? It's the um, it's the Russian in, from um, Nekama and also the um, Libero uh, from Nekama. Uh, I think... So wait, is Yaku the... I'm, oh, I, I'm confusing myself now. I don't know what's going on. Who knows what's going on? Not me. Uh, I do know there is a Lev... Nendo though um, and I maybe Yaku is Yaku even from Neko now I'm, ge now I'm getting confused see don't ask me I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a Yaku Nendo though and I do know that there's others the, there's two from the other school but um, yeah I don't have them because I really like I don't need to build entire teams of all of the characters um, because I only really care about these guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the great thing about Nando's as well is you can kind of pick and choose. And I didn't mention it with Karasuno Nando's or just kind of Nando's in general. If you're not a figure collector and you, you're like, what, what are you talking about? This is a type of figure where um, they're poseable. They, have, they come with a lot of accessories. Um, they come with various face plates and arms and um, just kind of like sometimes they have clothing attachments like you can see Kuro has his jacket on and the Nekama boys come with like little cats um, all of the all of the Haikyuu boys come with um, like a half net so it looks like you can pose them like they're about to spike the ball or, or slam the ball and, and win the thing um, they all come with volleyballs as well, but I only have um, Kagoyama posed with the ball because he's the setter and he's the only one who needs one right now. Um, but they come with like three or two or three different expressions and various arms and kind of accessories, so you can pose them however you want. And as I said, I don't buy a huge amount of them just because I don't change out the poses enough for me to worry about wanting them. So I do only ever really buy them if it's a character I really, really, really love and really want and or is a character that isn't going to get a figure any other way and I love. So uh, yeah, that's kind of my criteria for that. And also they kind of have to look good as Nendos, but the, the amazing thing about Nendroids and Japanese figure makers they can make that like they they make them really cute and appealing and I know like I don't want to get into the whole argument it's like oh yeah Nendroids are just the better Funko Pop because they are like way more expensive than a Funko Pop but Funko Pop in my opinion doesn't rarely achieves I think what it's trying to go for which is kind of a cutesy uh, miniature chibi-fied version of a popular character a lot of them just kind of look freaking creepy frankly um it's the dead eyes whereas these all any character regardless of of the series 
it could be high Q. It could be, I mean, not some A from Nelson's book of friends is getting one, uh, upcoming, uh, the, um, Elias from ancient Magus bride has one light Yagami from death Knight has one and they all really work well. And, um, as someone who isn't a fan of like the giant bobble head and like tiny body of most kind of chibi things, I think somehow Nendo's translate that idea very, very well and very effectively. And they capture the essence of the character very well. But, um, yeah, if you, I mean, I, this isn't to hate on people who enjoy Funko Pops. They're just not my thing personally. But yeah, so this is all of the like major figures that I have in my collection, or at least they're all the ones that fit in this middle um, bookcase cabinet. Mixing it up a little bit because I'm going to be doing underneath my normal um, filming setup. If you don't know, I film at a side table uh, like so. This is where I film my, but from this angle, like from over here. Um, but you can see my Pitchet, another Nendroid of a boy I love. My only Yuri on Ice Nendroid because he is, I, I love him, but he's not a character that's probably ever going to get a scale. He doesn't even have a prize figure. What is a girl to do if not buy the Nendo of their cute, their cute favorite characters? So that's what I did. But yeah, so I am going to go underneath this area and this is kind of where I collect a lot of my they're not really art books per se there are some art books down here but there's a lot of like guidebooks and things like that as well as you can see stack of anime um, we'll get to that in due time so first and foremost what's this at the front this is the Garden of Sinners recalled out summer release Japanese release um, limited edition release if anyone wants this you you can have it because I don't I just use it for display basically um, it doesn't have subtitles or anything it's just a thing that I have um, okay so in the very recesses of this apologies for the lighting as well because there's a major window here but it's kind of not enough light currently at in the day for it to get light inside of here so apologies but oh let's do this. We'll pull out, not this, but these, these are obviously file binders, the type of thing you have in school or your office. I put my clear files in here. So I have Hunter Hunter one, one, I have quite a few Hunter Hunter ones, these two, and I bought these at, um, some of them I bought in Japan, some I bought online, things like that. I don't buy too many clear files anymore uh, either. Hunter, 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 Hunter. A lot of Hunter, Hunter. Um, there's more. Ugh. Ugh. Hunter, Hunter. Hunter, Hunter. And then um, Evangelion. There's a Nerve one. And my boys. My boys. The boys. This was, this and the previous one were promotional ones you could buy at conventions here in Australia. I don't know. Haikyuu. I bought these ones in Japan because I went to, um, that theme park that doesn't exist anymore. I say theme park, that like indoor. It was in Sunshine 60, um, the jump kind of park indoor thing. There's another Haikyuu one. This one is from, um, Akiba Anime art magazine which was a kickstarter thing um and then these are from well this one is also from that but this one is from uh tokyo otaku mode they send them sometimes not that i use tokyo otaku mode very often anymore that one is also from there wandering sun i got this one in a convention if you don't know what a clear file is as well i'm just showing these off basically they're used to put your um papers in we got Full Metal Alchemist, Brotherhood, and Kyosa Giga, which is a series I love, and gets no merch. So I got some clear files whilst I was in Japan. 
200 yen for the pair of them. You got a Yomushi Petal, a series that I still haven't even finished, but I think this was an extra with a magazine that I wanted something else for. And Kisei from, um, what's called Kurka, same idea. Uh, I think I got him free with uh, something else. And also Kasumatsu, who is also on Kisei's team from Kurko. Hitalia, oh my god. Oof, my god, Hitalia. And then we got the allies from Hitalia, oh my god. Flash from the past. And then Black Butler. Um, I really like this one. I like the photograph type dealio. This is from the Book of Atlantic, i.e. the movie. And then, oh, the back of that one is cool too. Ooh, pretty look. And then we've got um, Monthly Girls Nozaki Kun. Yeah, so that's what's in this one. This is kind of like a, just a mix of everything, a lot of Shonen Jump series. This one is my boys. My boys. I talked about how free can monetize, how they can take my money each and every, pretty much every month for the past consistent like six years. How are they able to do this, you may ask. Gee, I thought you don't buy merchandise for a series. A lot of the time you would be true that would be a true statement you are absolutely correct but Kyoani knows how to take my money I already said this they got my money for this music for character songs for soundtracks they got my money for various DVD blu-ray releases they got my money for various figure collections what else? What else could there be? They got my money for various rubber straps and even like pins and just all of this crap. What else could there be? The answer is clear files. <laughs> so a lot of these, uh, like this one, is from a magazine. Look, oh, child, it's Christmas. This is appropriate. It's Christmas time. So it's okay if I have this one. That's fine. Look at these boys. Little baby boys. Childhood boys. Um, and then we have a clear file of, this is from Spoon, it also has a poster of the same image, which is also in this room, by the way. Um, and then we have this one, which is another magazine one, uh, and the back of that one. This is from second season, because you can tell these ones are earlier, because there's no Sosuke in there. Because um, Sosuke became important later. Got my, my boys on a date love them love that for them it's great um and then we've got i don't know like little italian should be i think these two came together i don't know there's always okay so this is how they get my money right every year every year since free started they put out birthday goods for the characters to celebrate their birthday. These are not real people, obviously. They're, and their, their birthday does not really exist because, you know, they're fictional characters. They were not born as such. But they have canonical birthdays and Kyoani puts out merch from their store for every boy. Um, so this was the first of their... Um, the first of their birthday things, this was Fresh Fruit Birthday, um, and I always get the clear files for them. Always get the clear files for them. Uh, so we have Haru, who's always the first one. His birthday, you can see here, is the 30th. Well, you can't see there, but it's the 30th of uh, June. And then next is, so they, and then they have like the normal art of a normal boy not being a chibi. Then we've got Nagisa, whose birthday is the 1st of August, and you got him, oh my god, we got Sasuke, who is the 14th of September, and there's his normal being a boy, Makoto, who is the 17th of November, and there he is, oh what a good boy, is this the first, I wanna, this is probably the first, then we've got um, Momotaro, who is the 6th of December. Oh my god, there's, these ones are really heavy because there's so many. I'm not kidding when I say there are so many of these boys. 
end of these things. So we've got Ray, who is the 14th of December. And you can tell they have like color themes as well. So there he goes. And then we've got Nitori or Aichiro, who is the first of Jan or the fourth of January. There we go. And oh, they always have like because they have this one is fruit, so they all have like a different fruit that is the theme of the artwork, right? So we've got Rin, who's the second of February. And um there's he is. And then okay more lore for free lore and free characters for those who don't watch the show this is kisei who is like the smallest of side characters he's introduced i mean he's part of the second novel when the boys are in middle school he's a classmate to haru and makoto kind of uh, Makoto is in a different class but um, he's their peer and he used to go to primary school with Rin and Sosuke so he like knows everybody but he's introduced briefly in the second season and he's also like kind of a prominent part of the film uh, the starting days film so yeah he's, he's like an additional character um, Kisumi Kisumi Shingo and there he is at the back so obviously oh my god he got a little baby Hayato how did I not realize that that's his little brother okay and again deep lore of the free franchise next these are so this was uh, I think the first time they did the birthday thing maybe um which obviously they started when Free Eternal Summer was coming out which was 2014 um, these ones, our characters look a little more baby, huh? Don't they? That is because this is when the movie, the middle school movie, was coming out, right? So we've got Haru. Again, their birthdays don't change, so I'm not going to say that all again. We've got Natsuya and Nao, who are their middle school senpais, captain and vice captain of the swim team. we got Makoto. You can... You, did you notice there's no Nagisa because Nagisa isn't part of these films because he's not in he's not the right age. Then we got Ikuya who is um, Natsuya's baby brother and uh, like an important character in that movie. And then season three again, oh so many. And then we got Asahi, who okay so Ikuya's birthday is the third of March, which is actually also my birthday. And then we have Asahi who's the 18th of August August what am I saying April and then this then okay then the next year um, timeless medley films came out you can see here timeless medley precious birthday so these are again high school versions of our boys we got Haru looking fine we got not oh, everyone looks fly as hell we got Nagisa we got um, Sasuke they are dapper. They are well-dressed boys. We got Makoto, if he wants to be in frame. We got Momo. This is probably the, the, the most cleaned up Momo has ever been in his entire freaking life. Let's be real. He looks like an actual person who might have a brain. That, that's not really the general consensus throughout the majority of the series otherwise. We got Ray. Rare Ray with zero glasses. What happened? Can you see... Are you wearing contacts? No, he's holding them. Why? What? Mm, glare. Was it the flash? Is that why you took them off? Or are you just... Mm. Anyway, I'm going to stop asking questions of characters who can't answer. You got Nisari. Mm, boy. Look at that rumpled style. Who did your hair? Who are their designers? We got Rin. Who, again, yet again, knows exactly what he's doing. We got Ikuya who looks like he just got off of a, like a, I don't know, out of a wedding. He's just like, oh, yeah, I had to go to my cousin's wedding. It was a thing. Don't worry about it. Um, we got Asahi, who is very buttoned up there. And then we got Kisumi, who looks like he, you, he looks like your rich friend, friend you go to. He has a trust fund that you're like, please, can I borrow some money? And he's like, oh, I'm investing in Bitcoin. 
Um, and that's the end of that, but that is not the end of free clear files. No, no, no. We're not going to jump into free clear files immediately for the final binder because we have some Yuri and Ice, again, my boys that I love and care about. This is probably from a magazine. Road trip, um, springtime, summertime. We got Pitchett and Yuri and Victor and Yuri. Why did I expect Yuri to be Chris? I don't know. Seems more his speed. We got them cosplaying back butler pretty much i don't know like why essential eating um instagram photo the two more the most important clear file to ever be made and um oh oh yeah these are from the museum, the Uranus Museum that was set up for a long time. Everyone uh, hanging out, being friends, all the boys. And then at a festival, these look like they're at a gallery or like their engagement party, just hanging out. I know where JJ is invited, but he was. And then this is a fan clear file of Makachin, but also, not to me. Look at my boy. Wait, if I could get him in frame. Oh, so sweet, not to me. This is the good shit. And then I have a wipe in there because you can see there's a yokai. And if you take the paper out, it kind of overlaps. Got Nyanko Sensei, and uh, this is a manga clear file for not to me. And oh my god, my arms hurt. Apologies if this is just like terrible filming. Um, more Natsume. Oh my god, these more manga. These would have come with the magazine. Lala, that Natsume is um, <sighs> published in. And yet another Natsume. You can tell, maybe, if you pay attention, noticed. Uh, Natsume has gray hair in the manga. Um, darker hair. He's like blonde in the anime. Here we have uh, some of the JFF film festivals. Um, I keep this pamphlet in particular because hey kids Chai Furu, the live action. I love those movies and I saw it in all three of them thanks to the Japanese film festival here in Australia. Um, here are some more pamphlets in relation to things I care about. So high speed movie uh, timeless medley movie this is the artwork that's used on the box for this uh, u.s release other side of that pamphlet and then we have a silent voice as well um, these would have come with orders and just like promotional bits um, black butler book of the atlantic and the back side of black butler the book of the atlantic and okay we're back to more free this might have been the first one, actually. Not the, I think the fruit one was the first one for season two, but I think these are the actual first, first ones. So we have Haru. Yeah, no, no. Dive to the future. No, these would have been last year's then. The flower, okay, these are last year. Jesus Christ. See, there's so many clear files, I can't even pay, I, I have no idea. So we have Haru, and then these ones have like three different little chibis on the back. We got Nagisa, as per expected, the chibis on the back. Natsuya, because we got to include every boy. Every time a new boy is introduced, we have to include him. Now, who is a sweetheart, I love him. And chibis, we got Sosuke. I don't, their, their flowers all mean something, I'm sure, but I don't know what it is. Makoto, my boy. Here you go. Momo. Ugh, oh my god, my arms. These are like, sure, they're just little bits of plastic, but when you have so many together, they're heavy. We got Rei, Rei, Nitori, or Aichiro, as you can see there. And Ichiro, Rin, Rin, almost at the end, oh my god, Ikuya, 
Ikuya, Asahi, Asahi. Oh my god. I don't think they did Kisumi for this that year, which was last year. But that doesn't mean that free has finished because oh no no no. How dare well, they couldn't they couldn't take a year off. That would be preposterous. I am not completely up to date with these because I have quite a few in my Japanese proxy. But this is this year's birthday queer files, okay? I'm still doing it. I'm still making the mistakes of my past, but it's fine. I spend my money in the ways that make me happiest. <laughs> so I have her. Um, I really like this um, this theme, which is Link Up Smile. Cheers with the smile. Oh, they're so cute. And this year as well. Okay, the first year, which was the flower one, and this year, I actually have also been buying, again, says the person who doesn't buy merch i've been buying the rubber strap because they they usually have they know they have like wall tapestries they have the rubber strap they have pins they have all different things and i like the rubber straps i tend to um with these i tend to frame them together with the whole thing so you got her you got nagisa so there's the thing and there's his little his little rubber strap and all of these ones come with um like a it's a coaster it's a little puzzle piece and the idea it comes with a message on the back written by the character and then you can um, put them all together as um, like a larger puzzle see so her and then handwriting oh my gosh so nice handwriting um <coughs> pardon me we have Natsuya and then his rubber strap and then now and his rubber strap and then finally for the ones that I have with me currently and are not in Japan waiting for me to pay for shipping is Sasuke who is September so I believe, um, and there's his thing, we should, I should be, um, I should have um, Makoto waiting, I'm pretty sure, both um, Momotaro and maybe, did Momo have one this year? I don't remember because it, he's not really a major part of the new season, so maybe not, um, but Rin, Rin? Why do I say Rin? Ray should. Anyway. That's what that is. You, whenever I talk about clear files, that's what I'm talking about. My arms hurt now after going through all of those. This really is a bits and bobs shelf um, here. Oh my gosh, look. Okay, so this is a special booklet, as it says on the front, Tribute Gallery History. Uh, so this was a prize in Ichiban Kuji. This, I bought this because this is the closest thing we have yet of Natsume's art book look at this oh my god stand up please all i'm asking for you so yeah so we've got natsume and right his grandmother reiko this is kind of artwork from this particular campaign and oh my gosh so beautiful i love natsume as you guys should know so again not really a big deal and we don't have an art book from Midorikawa. I would pay good money for one, but we don't. So this is the next closest thing. Oh, I like this one, a Reiko, a lot. Oh my god, if I could put it in a thing. And we got that one. And... Oh. It's like a lot of different artworks. This particular piece that I'm showing off now, I actually got a figure. Um, made after it, based on it. This is pretty cute with all the different yokai who generally show up. Uh, yeah, you saw the clear file of this one. So these would have been all for the same kind of prize figure campaign. And again, here's the that same picture and the yokai. Oh, oh, so pretty. Oh, so pretty. This is a really nice oversized book as well, which is why I like 
this one in particular. And the style in some of these pieces is kind of unique. And um, I don't know if you can find it, uh, especially the clear files and stuff, because they're older. And this also had a figure made of it once upon a time. Uh, so yeah, and then you can see like these what are other uh, prizes that you could have won and uh, Earlier on you can see here like these are prizes that would have been in this This particular you got two different I guess prize figures and more like little trading figures So yeah, that's what that is really love it good. Oh, I forgot a clear file not a free one. You are saved this time. But this is my Shinto Okage clear file that I got when I ordered a portrait from him earlier in the year. Next is, oh my god. Oh, 2011 special calendar. Um, so this is, as it says, it's a 2011 calendar. This was uh, the calendar that came out uh, the year that Full Metal Alchemist ended, or j the year after Full Metal Alchemist ended, and at the time it had a bunch of exclusive artwork. But now, if you have the art book um, that Viz put out, I believe most of this is included in that art book. And so, this was my calendar for 2011, which was my first year of university, just by the way. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like with most Japanese calendars, this is, uh, actually it's a little bit different than most Japanese calendars in that this is just a single month per page. A lot of the times, um, the anime calendars is two months per page, so you only get six pieces of artwork. This is all Arakawa's artwork for Full Moon Alchemist. And I don't, I just kept it. I'm sure I could maybe frame it someday, who knows. Next is, okay. So, I'm going to start doing it this way. This, what do you think this is? It says Secret Base, 12 years after special package. This is a CD, but it is packaged to look like a record. And this is the ending um, song for Anahana. So, yeah, the packaging. And this is the only way it was released as well. Like, this isn't some special fancy version I went out of my way to get. This is, like, the at least at the time, this was the only release that this CD had. And this is the, this is the, this is the thing. Oh, uh, Anohana ending song, music, single. Uh, here we have a Kickstarter 2.75D, uh, or 2.7D, um, thing. It's just like a doujin. And you can see this is made so if you wear the blue and red glasses it actually is meant to pop out for all of this artwork it actually does work kind of well it came with 3d glasses it's a little bit hokey but this is the actual proper uh magazine that that was bundled with again kickstarter just various artwork from different artists and this is back when i um pledged to a lot more comic um, people on um, Kickstarter. I still do, but not as much. I was a little bit less. I used to um, pledge to a lot. This is the art of Fault Mi Milestone 1, which is a printed art book, basically. I don't remember why I have this. It's It was a visual novel that was coming out at the time, I think, and also being Kickstarted. Um, I think Fault like, the actual game has something to do with someone. I don't know. That That's really helpful, G. It has something to do with someone. That's great. Good job. I don't know. I have it. It's there. It's got some nice artwork, but it's not, like, a brilliant thing to have. Especially for a game that I will never play, because I do not play games. Um, also, just by the way, these are like, I'm not going to pull them out, but they're like um, bags. This is a Mushishi bag. Oh my god, get my hand out of the way. Mushishi, Mushishi. This came with a doujin, illustrated doujin uh, from Mushishi that I bought ages ago. This is Big Wind Up 
uh, Pash, which is kind of like a gar guide book slash art book for this wonderful baseball series. You can see, oh my god, there's a poster, or a couple posters at the beginning. Um, yeah, like a lot of guide books, it's just a lot of big art character stuff. I got this for like 300 yen in a uh, Mandrake or something. Uh, might have been Toyo Books. Who knows? But again, Ofori is a much underrepresented series and I love it. And so I, I picked it up. It was cheap. And it had a couple posters and things like that. So why not? Okay, so next is an actual manga thing that people might be interested in. I spoke about the Louvre manga before. This is Guardians of the Louvre by Jerry Taniguchi. <clears throat> um, yeah, English release, like with the Araki one, full color. And uh, yeah, it's just about a guy who is visiting Paris and uh, he kind of was looking for the history of different art pieces. He gets drawn into them, um, but also kind of goes a little bit delirious because of sickness and he starts thinking he's hallucinating. It's just, it's very Taniguchi, very self-reflective, reminiscent type of thing. And uh, yeah, it's a good, like, I, I would recommend it and it's kind of a must get if you are a Taniguchi fan. Uh, next is N is Pepita Inoue meets Gaudi. So this is the same. This is an interesting book that Viz put out. It's uh, Takehiko Inoue um, and his kind of understanding and and sort of biography of Gaudi, the the Im very important and very <laughs> well known famous architecture architect um, from Spain. Um, if you don't know who Inoue is, he is, or if that name sounds familiar, but you can't remember where that name is from, Vagabond, real, slam dunk, he's that guy. Uh, so this is a interesting book, like it's actually a, you can see there's information, but it is kind of a character study and art study book on on the people in Gaudi's life and his works and things like that. It's it's not something that I think everyone has to own, but if you like either of these creators, if you like artists being inspired by other artists, then check it out. I mean, that's there's some incredible stuff in here and it is very informative. I would, it's kind of like a guidebook. And if you have an interest in architecture, then uh, check it out. I got, it f I, th I think this was like $8 from my Amazon locally when I got my copy. So um, I think you can find copies for fairly cheap because it's not like a must-have book for anime fans. Um, certainly doesn't appeal to the general, I don't think. But it is a beautiful book. Beautiful book. Next is another art book. Oh my gosh. This is um, Koji Kumita, the first and last art book. Um, so on the front here, Sayonara Setsubo Sensei, probably what a lot of people know him for. He's also done other stuff, uh, but most of it would be Setsubo Sensei artwork, which is a comedy satire about a high school teacher who is always in despair and his various students and it it's kind of a rapid fire um, comedy and um, look at societal things I don't know there's a lot to it oh my gosh what is going on here um, there's a lot of it that I feel is very like it's hard to translate to to English, which is why it's taken so long. The manga didn't do well in English for one. It was dropped by Dark Horse many a year ago. The anime has just recently been licensed by Nozomi, I believe. So we are seeing the, at least season one. 
Uh, there's a couple seasons, um, but this is from Maria Hollick. That's art for that. There is, I don't know what that is, but is that a Gundam thing? Yes, probably. Something to do with Gundam. Loom from uh, Ursa Yatsura. Arslan? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I recognize that. Here you go, Arslan. Um, don't know about this one. This one is Genshiken. And this is not his works. These are just works he's done artwork for. And then this is the other stuff that people might recognize his style for because he did the the Blu-ray covers and some, I guess, maybe other covers for The Eccentric Family, which is the series I love and what I care about. Evangelion? No, that's not Evangelion. I don't know. I don't know. That's video game stuff. Characters I don't know. That's Bell Dandy. Looks like it. I don't know. Might not be. Who are you people? I don't know. That is Kim Go Orange Road, I think. I don't know. When it gets to this older style, I'm like, I have no idea who you are. Kid, you could be anyone of like five different people. But yeah, so it's a mix of like work that he's actually worked on and then fan kind of art for stuff he hasn't worked on or just sort of tangentially linked to. Which is pretty cool. I think a lot, most creators do that just by the way. They do like have art for properties that they aren't exactly tied to because they like the characters. They want to draw them in their style. Or they might have been done, asked to do a promotional piece for, for them. And so they do that because that's what they're paid to do. That's how life works. I'm going to put all of these back in here. And then, um, so next we have, oh, poster book. Did I buy this by itself for, for this reason? No, it would have come with something else. These are just like a, you're meant to hang it on your wall. So you're like, yes, I have pretty hot boy character on, I'm, I love my boy. Um, not my kind of thing. I don't need a standing picture of Aichiro Nitori for my wall. Oh my god! Oh, they have the baby versions too! Look, junior high! Oh my god! I didn't know... <laughs> I'm very... I was surprised. And there's my boy. Uh, I just want to protect them. Then we have a little baby Asahi. And Ikuyo is next. And we'll see if they... Do they have the senpai? Yeah! But like baby version of the senpai. So middle school version, Nausea, and middle school version now. Dang. I, yeah, I, that would have come with uh, probably a different book that I bought for free stuff. Because, again, a lot of these things come bundled with other things. This is Blue Exorcist um, pamphlet for the movie, which earlier in my videos is the only part of the Blue Exorcist anime that I own because I think it's really good and I think it captures the best parts of the manga. I think it's a good it's a good film. Oh, even just looking at the screenshots I get all soft hearted. Dang it. Um, yeah, so I have that which I would have bought. I also have this is a, a Dojin, I would have bought, um, there is the artist, so maybe look them up, I don't know if they're still on there, you can see, look, 2010, this is way back from my early days, but this is a art book that an artist would have been selling, or did sell at Artist Alley, here, so, oh, and it, this would all, probably be all original artworks. Uh, we are quite lucky in my city because we have a lot of um, artists that travel from Southeast Asia to sell their books, as well as the more local artists. Um, I think I also have a print of this one somewhere hidden. There's a lot. It's probably a 40 
or a 25 page book who knows so yeah that's pretty cool though it's not like a fandomy thing this is a art book for the light novel series Bungaku Shoujo or Book Girl a light novel series one of the first that I ever read and one that I absolutely love about a girl who literally eats novels um, she's kind of a weird goblin creature who subsists on the written word if I could get these in frame that I need to adjust my camera holy moly there we go so yeah this is our main character our main female character that's our main character but Polka and uh, Kaname something along those lines um, so this is all our work from books Konoha Inoue geez it's been a while since I read the series it's an eight volume series you can actually read it in English legally from Yen Press it's one of the first light novel series they put out um, it's only eight volumes I do think it's um, out of print but you can get it oh my god um, so this is fan art from other artists not the general um, the normal artist for the series this is the um, thing that makes a lot of sense uh, so yeah it's a story about a teenage boy who writes stories and he's in the literature club kind of being strong armed into joining by his senpai who is a literal um she calls herself like a uh, i don't know she she eats the writ written words and that's like all she eats that's her food and she loves his his stories because they taste the best and each each book is kind of centered around a famous piece of generally Japanese literature and it's a really good time I would encourage you if you want to read it you can still get it digitally from like Kindle things like that uh, which is what I was going to say before I got sidetracked about something else uh, but yeah um, <laughs> there is a film in like a couple of OVAs but for this series anime um, but we don't have them licensed in English and I doubt we'll see them anytime soon here's another one this is actually in relation to one of the probably the film or the OVAs so you can see like there's an anime style and I would have gotten this one I'm pretty sure I got this one in Japan when we were there so yeah there is an anime for this light novel series that exists it's really powerful although Fair warning for people who are wanting to read it. It's it each book is pretty heavy. Like it's pretty full on in the way that like there are some dark themes in literature and the reason they're chosen for the main theme or the main focus of the book is because those themes are happening in in the novel. Next is this which looks like I don't know but this is uh, the Wolf Strain art book from the UK Ultimate Edition. So, character designs, lots of character design, lots, oh my gosh, so much settings. Um, there might be some, yeah, and then here we have like actual art. So, this would have, this came with the Blu rays, and so it's just a nice extra art book type deal. This is the type of thing that. Um, anime limited likes to do pretty much nice to have that what is this oh my god another movie pamphlet for phantom rouge from hunter hunter obviously kurapika i got some togashi art at the beginning and then like this movie has its problems but it's not the worst movie ever it's inconsistent but the stuff that togashi wrote was pretty freaking good plus it kind of was nice to see some of these characters again and also you know oh my god look at those prize figures I remember when those were coming out <sighs> and more Togashi 
artwork. This is the villain of the film, and he's not in the manga, so that's why he drew him there, probably. Um, next, what is this? What is, oh, oh, cal 2017 calendar. So this was your own ice. This, yeah, I would have bought because it's Kubo's artwork. Look, oh my gosh. It's like really, really nice. I like it. And you can see it has like little illustrations on the bottom as well. So we got pictured there. Boys. Um, summertime, summertime. No popsicle for you gotta run beach selfies serious competition mode oh my god Yuria looks so angry look at him Ugh. um yeah that loser these guys just a bunch of just a bunch of skaters as per expected and also um it's in english but you can see like they have their Every, all of the skaters' birthdays in in the calendar. And this is like a Japanese product, so I, it's kind of cool that it's all in English because I'm sure they knew that international fans would be buying it. Hey, guys. Taking photos, eating food, doing spins. Um, and then, yeah, important artwork. This is Kuba artwork. Oof, good times. And then, yeah, skate, 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 the end, that's all, but yeah, that was probably my count. that was my calendar for 2017, <laughs> like, I bought it, oh my gosh, I can take this thing off, maybe I don't want to, maybe don't keep it protected, hmm, I have to think about it when I put it back. Here's, okay, I showed you the book before. This is the actual doujin, illustrated doujin of Mushishi. So this is, you know, it's artwork of Mushishi from fan artists. And this is a Japanese release. Like this is, they would have sold this at a, like a comic cat type deal. Oh, oh, so many talented artists. I think this is a collective one as well. Like, so it's a different artist um, for each piece or... Um, a couple different artists within the book. You can tell because there's different styles. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Full color illustration fan book of Mushishi. So there's all types of stuff you can get. And evidently there's all types of stuff in the art book that came with the Darker Than Black um, Blu-rays that Funimation put out. It's, it's literally just an art book. Or filled with, you know, promotional art for Darker Than Black, which is fine. Um, pretty cool addition to have. I, You guys who have stuck around and who watched this last video that I put up for the collection, I threw away the packaging for this, but I kept the book because, hey, why not? I like this show, and, um, you know, it's a decent little extra for what it is. All this stuff is really stuff that I'm not, like, in love with. I don't need to have, except for, uh, this was very kindly, um, not given to me because I didn't pay for it, but, um, Hunter Fan on, um, Hunter Fan or is it Huntress Fan on Twitter was going to Japan. They were going to the Chihaifu art exhibit and they very kindly offered to, uh, get me something else that I will show later in this video or in this collection tour but this was the actual I guess pamphlet or event booklet for oh my god guys look, for this event and they they offered um to get me a copy because they knew how much I love to have her if they if I wanted a copy and I was willing to send the money they'd be happy to send it my way and Needless to say, I am eternally grateful. I'm still in awe that a kind of relative stranger would go out of their way for me to, to get me something like this is amazing. And it really does mean a lot because, again, another artist who doesn't have an art book for their manga 
And so this is kind of the closest thing to it. Look how beautiful it is. I just, I, I love it so much. Oh, my girl. Hello. Look, best girl, my girl. Oh, even better. Look at her. What a cutie. I should make that. Um, I should make that a profile picture somewhere. But yeah, so lots of great stuff. Oh boy, boy oh, Ooh. and obviously, um, you know. Oh, another look at all the rare Canada's. Good times. I gotta, I gotta maximize. These are from the novels, because uh, look at those baby faces. Yeah, so really, really wonderful, really happy to have this. Absolutely adore it. And thank you so much, Huntress fan. You are absolutely amazing, and I love you. Uh, but yeah, this was for the 10th anniversary of Chihai for basically, which is why they were having the event. And uh, yeah, I'm going to put this stuff back here. I'm going to put this in here. Next are... Um, Illustrate or illustrate English fanzines um, bubbles. I have one, two, and three. These are really interesting. A lot of really cool interviews with comic people across the industry. Um, a lot of manga stuff, a lot of American comic stuff, uh, translators, artists, things like that. Super duper awesome, and I highly recommend it. Their fourth book is is out already and I need to get it because I've been meaning to get it. They're only six dollars per book um, plus shipping which is if you're in the US like nothing it's maybe a couple bucks. Pick them up support them and if you're interested in comics and comic creation absolutely check it out. This okay here's another art book and this one's a hefty one. This is the Full Mail Alchemist Ultimate Edition art book. This came with the UK Ultimate Edition obviously compared to the wool strain one like that was that was fine that was whatever this is oh my god this is heavy this is like 300 pages worth of stuff so we've got character stuff and then again this is for 2003 anime we've got setting stuff oh my god so many settings oh we got um yeah so you can compare the the original sketch and then the final drawing so plenty of those which is pretty cool for some pretty iconic um, artwork and this is just like a gallery of artwork promotional art that longtime fans will probably be um, familiar with yeah so it is definitely like a very art focused art book I mean understandably the book that came with the US like super fancy release that Funimation put out before they lost the license is it does have more interviews and like informational stuff which I think is also really valuable but I think from my memory it wasn't really interviews with creators it was more just like oh um, here's all of the history of alchemy in the thing or something like I it wasn't a must-have or it was with English staff I don't remember um, but I didn't want to pay for double the thing and I was just I I had my heart set on the UK release and I'm not you know upset about getting the UK release what is this oh another movie pamphlet book library war uh, the Wings of Revolution. Hey, it's exactly, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a movie pamphlet. What do you want, what do you expect? Pretty much that's all there is to that. Another movie pamphlet next with, um, this is the Rebellion film. Puella Magi Madoka Magi, Magica. Um, Ma Puella Magi Madoka Magica, the movie Rebellion, which is the third and final film. Uh, this I got at the Australian screening for this. They're handing them out. Um, so that's pretty cool. And also, look, The Wind Rises, because this was about to come out in cinemas in Australia when uh, when Madoka was coming out. You can tell. February 
7th. What year was this? Who knows? Mysterious year. 2013. There we go. Man, time flies, I tell ya. I've had, I've owned this, this pamphlet since 2013. It's amazing what you discover when you go crawling around in the crap you own. These are a bunch of, this is the um, doujin of Chayama Ryusuke for artworks. This was a prize or an additional uh, reward for the Time of Eve Kickstarter. Really cool little book. Comes with a little postcard. Again, really appropriate. Christmas time. Not that it's snowing here, but oh, Christmas. Coincidental. Anyway, so that was a really cool little add-on. Um, I like when creators can put out fanzines or doujin, whatever you want to call it. This was another doujin that was funded on Kickstarter. Head headphones design idea book 2013 English version because it had already been released in Japan this was to translate it all and so it yeah it would have like a set of headphones that actually exists and then it would have like a cute anime girl wearing those headphones right so like oh look this cute anime girl is wearing Beats by Dre and then Next, it's like, oh, look at all the information about Beats by Dre. Basically, that's what this is. Um, I mean, from a design standpoint, there's some pretty cute headphones here. And some cute girls wearing headphones. I mean, there's, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's all it is. That's what it is. Oh, my arm cracked. I hope none of you heard that, but it cracked really loudly. And this is, again, from that same Kickstarter. This is just like a sketchbook of those same things but unfinished and then an additional interview so you know pretty cool oh my god next is this which um is devil's line artworks this came with the limited edition of one of the japanese uh volumes of devil's line a manga that i love well, you haven't seen it yet in the collection but don't worry it's coming um uh, <laughs> one of my favorite vampire manga and I really 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 appreciate um this creator's works now I think they do a good job and I can't wait I hope we see their next uh or their current work that's just started get licensed into English at some point okay this is the only one of these that I have so far but there's like four or five of them this is scribbles this is uh this was an extra in uh, Harta magazine or Fellows, and this is Karamori artwork. Just a little bit of a you know collection of doodles and art art that she's put together, and they are impossible to hunt down because obviously Mori is very popular, and these aren't sold like properly. They're just like extras with the magazine. They pop up on Mandarake from time to time, so I'm hunting there. This was a little extra booklet that you got with the Blu-ray, no, no, the DVD release of Sweet Blue Flowers, which uh, knows let me put out. It's like heavy cardstock. It's just like a little extra thing from Lucky Penny, uh, which is Nozomi's budget uh, release thing. Okay, next we have here, finish with the oversized things thank goodness for that my arms hurt um <laughs> if i wasn't complaining enough next we have a uh, horimiya guidebook which is 10.5 so this would have come out just after volume 10 came out so we have some comics we have some gu guidebooks just are generally like oh here's some character stuff and some interviews and some whatever else and then at the end in this one per in particular they have a bunch of colored artwork which is pretty cool because again this series I doubt will get an art book I mean maybe maybe I'll be wrong I hope so but this is the best opportunity to get you know art for a series like this and I don't really ever invest in uh, guidebooks in general if they otherwise 
unless they bring value to me. Next is an art book, although it's sized like a uh, um, guidebook. This is the Japanese release of Zaki, which is the Tokyo Ghoul art book. So the the um, American version is like an A4. This Japanese version is Tonkabon version, so you can just slot it next to your your um, volumes. But that's not that's not how it works. So you just got all the artwork from the series, covers, things like that. And various promo art as per expected. It's a cool little book. Um, these are from the light novels. I know that because I have read them. Um, Tokyo Ghoul is a series that I, I like. Um, I haven't read a lot of Re, which is the sequel series. I think there's a, I had problems with it because there's a lot of potential with characters and character dynamics that I feel the series unfortunately doesn't explore a huge amount. Um, so I don't own it, but I feel like there's a lot of, I, I do like how empathetic the characters are and I do like how much care Ishida puts into the series and you can tell how much he's he tries to like have his characters work through their problems with a lot of nuance but I do think that there's potential that was squandered which is why I like I I have great respect for the series I think it does a lot of things very well but Personally, it's not a series that I have in my collection, although I, I did read the manga and I did enjoy it. And I am hoping to read Re. I've read like one or two volumes of Re. I'm just going to wait till the end and then read it all on the Shonen Jump app because that's how I roll. That's how I live my life. Next is, um, I kind of got this one because it came free with the other thing, but this is the first Japanese volume of Navarno. Hmm. I mean, it's a, well, it's just volume one, but how we in Japan look, it's a pretty cool book, and um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good there. One of my favorite series, or one of my most surprised and beloved series, but I bought the lot, I guess, because. It came with this one, which is the guidebook. Again, not that this has like a whole bunch of, I mean, it does have some color artwork. Not any more than, I'm pretty sure the artwork is included in the art book, so you don't need to buy it for this, but I don't know. I thought, I was, it, I think for the two of them, it was like literally six dollars. So I was like, why not? I like this series. In fact, I love this series. So I should buy it. It's not a huge investment. It was six dollars on free shipping, so just a cool little quirky thing. Looks like it came with something. I don't know. Yeah, you can see that this this came out before um, the manga ended because it's advertising volume nine and it's advertising the art book, which I do have two copies of, in fact. Um, next, hi Q, hi Q art book look at the little tiny thing um, but this one is full full color love it love my boys um, I do wish that Shonen Jump or like a lot of these Shonen uh, art books had larger art book releases because these are cute but A4 would be nice even heck I'd take you know a a five that'd be good um th these are just like super teeny and uh yeah IQ, one of my favorite uh, jump series at least and it's a good time and yeah so ugh. and then another guidebook or fan book with lovely Com complex this was one of my earliest i think eBay purchases, which is weird to think about, huh? So we got color artwork. There's a lot of like really fun um, design stuff here. Like all of these characters, I didn't mention it. 
when I was talking about the manga, how amiss of me. But the, these characters actually like change clothes a lot. Like, um, they, and then here's like anime stuff. Not that. This. Um, yeah, so it's just a bunch of art, but they, they change their outfits. Like they're very fashion focused, or at least the creator is very fashion focused. And then, uh, yeah, this is the live action that was happening at the time. And look, okay, see, that's what their height difference would be like in real life. Um, and leaving on this cover, like, it's not even that bad. But if you look at the anime, it's just like, oh my god, they're so, so different. So height difference. Um, see, look. Like, ooh, ooh, so different. And it's like, no, that's like, this is the actuality. Sure, there's a height difference, but it's not like... I don't know. It's not the worst thing ever. And yeah, this would have come out after all of the books, because those are... Volume 17 is the last cover. Oh my gosh. And then finally, we have the Kush um, Japan... Comic. So this is just a bunch of little indie um, alternate comics from um, from Japan. It, and Kush, if you're not familiar with, is a European uh, little comic that comes out, I think, every month. They always have a theme. Generally European comic creators. But because the theme was Japan, it was all Japanese comic creators. And uh, this is like really the indie stuff. This is the stuff that doesn't get interested interest in by the general public because it's it's not you know generic anime style of whatever. So yeah, cool little book. I'm pretty sure you can still pick it up from their website. Okay, from here, look, it's a whole stack of stuff. We've got. The two recent Lupin the Third movies, Barefoot Gen, both films, The Empire of Corpses film, Gunsmith Cats, Explosive Edition, the, the OVAs, The Pet Girl of Sakurasso, Record of Loros War, the OVA and TV series, Toward the Terror, which is the TV show version of the manga, and I also showed the film last video, or the first video of this collection so this is the more recent anime adaptation Allison and Lilia which is a series based off a of light novel series written by the creator of Kino's Journey so that's pretty cool and this is about aviation and flight and being a pilot X which is the clamp series and earthquake powers or something I don't know I haven't watched it yet and that's the theme of the stack is I haven't watched it yet, so that's why it's here. And I don't want to put it on the shelves because I might not like it and I might sell it at some point. So I have X, the complete collection. That's the TV show, obviously. Blast the Tempest, which is an old, like, weird sci-fi. Um, I mean, kind of sci-fi. There's a magical element to it, I think, as well. Um, done by Bones. It's based off of a manga, I believe. And then Nana. All the full set, which I still haven't even looked at because I have had <laughs> other things to watch. So yeah, this whole stack is my basically my physical backlog of anime, which is pretty good. It's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven shows, and then an OVA, and then four films, five films technically. Um, so I could get through that, but. Uh, I'm, I probably should sit down and watch it. <laughs> I, I don't like to have a huge physical backlog for too long. And that would mean that I close the gap and could finally say that, yes, I know about everything that I own in my series, in my series, in my collection. And also, if I have watched them and enjoyed them or not enjoyed them, it just allows me to have be more informed and can sell them. And make room for stuff that I do care about, which is always a good thing. I don't really blind buy a uh, series a lot anymore at all, kind of full stop at all. Um, but for some of this stuff, like Toward the Terror, I 
expect I will like because I like the other iterations of it. Allison and Lilia, I will at least find decent. X, I wanted to give a try because people enjoy... I mean, people... I'm not a huge client fan, but I'll give anything a try. Blast of Tempest, I have actually seen six or seven episodes of, and I do want to finish it at some point. Nana, of course, is Nana, everyone. It's kind of a beloved series, but I haven't, again, haven't watched it yet. Um, Lotus War, I've seen the OVA, which is great. TV show, I haven't heard good things about, so I want to kind of watch it and then make the decision on whether I want to just get the the single keep case re-release um, rather than keep that. And then I've heard good things about Pet Girl of Soccer, so um, despite the name. And Gunsmith Cut, like all of these are, are ones that I do want to watch, um, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I'm too busy making five hour long videos for YouTube. <laughs> um, yeah, so... So yeah, I'm hopeful that I can finish these or watch these at some point, hopefully over this next month or so. I'm not going to be.